the Commission on the Use of Radio Frequency Technology. Dr. Katherine Albrecht from SpyChips.com, what's going on today? Well, we are meeting here to hash out some legislative uh, recommendations on the issue of RFID. We're going to be taking a look today at the issue of labeling, hopefully uh, passing a recommendation that RFID tag products should have labels on them. We're going to be looking at uh, consumer notice, what form of notice, uh, if any, would be required beyond a label. We'll be looking at issues of deactivation, should these tags be activated at the check stand. And uh, perhaps most importantly, we'll be looking at government use of RFID, which is very, very relevant right now, considering that uh, several other border states have recently gotten in cahoots with Homeland Security security to begin issuing RFID tagged driver's licenses. We think that is a uh, serious potential privacy risk for people who carry those, not only uh, risk from in the invasion of their privacy by marketers, by uh, government officials, but also potentially by criminals, stalkers, and others. So this is what we will be uh, here all day. They're bringing us lunch. We are here from morning until night, so uh, as long as it takes until we get some, some consensus and a recommendation out of the Commission. They're all off the ground. Oh, good. Let me keep looking. Oh, good. 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 <clears throat> to review the proposed amendment to House Bill 686. Um, again, I welcome the floor for discussion. Yes, sir. I believe uh, that uh, in line three, the uh, uh, discussion that we had about tracking devices, using tracking devices, uh, where we replace it with remotely readable devices for the purpose of tracking, as in line 11. I don't think that change was picked up in that uh, line of two. So it's just a housekeeping matter. Well, it's a great direction now, so we we'll just basically use the same language for us. Yes. We'll just use the same language as for us. All right, what I'm, what I'm going to propose is any sort of minor technical changes. We'll, we had to get an amendment number and we literally had to publish something so that we could get it on the floor and into a hearing process. And so if there's any sort of technical glitches, we obviously would just go forward and ask them to correct those technical glitches. So, you know, we just had to start. Any other comments, please? Good. I guess we can all by lunch get a green on the label and consumer notification be activated. <laughs> That's just absolutely wonderful. All right, just to, to, we'll go to then point number two, which would be the final approval of the interim report. I want to make sure before it's sent out that we're all quite content and happy with that. And the reason I'm sort of backtracking a little bit is we've all had a lot of other stuff going on. And in my mind, it's been cluttered with a lot of other things as well, so I apologize if we're busy time, but I don't think it hurts in this case. Now, is there any comments on the interim report? And hearing none, then I would entertain a motion to accept the interim report. So okay, Representative, Representative, Mr. Erickson, uh, makes a motion to accept the interim report. And Representative Clark seconds. Right. Any discussion? Great. All those in favor? Okay. And opposed? No opposition. Good. That's perfect. Uh, when we go uh, to the hearing, I guess, with Congress, I will go and represent this position strictly, and I will make no other claim whatsoever. And what I will do is indicate that if asked that we're working on certain other issues. Acceptable. And I encourage everyone to come before that uh, that uh, hearing and state or express whatever sentiments they feel are important or discouraging or making comments. But I think this is a position so far that we can all agree. So at least we have a good step one going forward. Okie doke. <clears throat> then we'll go right to the business at hand. And I have just worked with uh, 
Ms. Smarling has put out a list of those things that I think we really need to continue to work on and at least reach some kind of consensus or agreement. My hope would be that were we able to do this, actually, if we could get a bill out of the House and the bill goes over to the Senate, we could ought to possibly at least take one or two or three or four of these things and have it attached to the Senate side and keep the ball rolling and keep the process rolling so that we could be way ahead of the game. So it's my hope that, I don't think this bill is going to get out before crossover, to be quite truthful, which is going to be mid-March. So it's my hope that when it goes to the Senate, we might have some language that we could attach on the Senate side that we could all agree to, particularly when it comes to things like deactivation and labeling and notification and both of the others. Does anyone have any comments or ideas or suggestions to that effect? Nothing. So we're all agreed that we could get that. Well, so we're all okay. So labeling's fine. We should label. Devil's in the details. The problem is that the, the house wasn't planning to go ahead with any type of bill based upon what we're coming up with. Uh, this is an amendment on the existing piece of legislation that they pulled back in off the floor. So what they did was they agreed to allow us to make sure that this was considered. We just had to have a rehearing with this. I was feeling that it was sufficiently different from the original text that it would be best to have a rehearing. Then it would go back on to the floor and be voted on. And I think hopefully what we've passed so far for the future of this commission will go forward to the Senate. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I, uh, I talked to, to Matt Hood the other day. He said that uh, he thought that had been, it, they had not planned to move ahead on, in, in the House on this. No, 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 no. They had not planned to move ahead with that legislation yeah. in the House right. based on the fact that this commission was working on certain yeah. things. Yeah. The things in the right. amendment so right. far that they have agreed right. to is what they will then use as a basis to move forward. Okay. Right. If you all feel that something's critically important, some specific item or issue, I don't want your hands to be tied. I think it's important that you go to the committee and say, we think this is great. However, we think that we like, for example, strict liability. You see my point? Mm -hmm. I would personally not make any recommendations one way or the other, except for just this. Mm -hmm. that so, is, is that make it a little more clear? Or is that more see, we could have gone the other route. We literally could have asked for new legislation, but that would have just uh, uh, prolonged the time. So why not just use an existing view? Okay. Let's start with um, let's start with uh, label, and I'd like to open the floor up for that discussion. Mr. Well, Chairman, yes, sir. I'm sorry. I was under the impression that there were still items from previous discussions that were, in essence, unfinished business um, relative to tracking individuals. There was language that was, I think, um, folks were working on from two meetings ago relative to inadvertent reading. Right. Correct. And, and I was hoping that, in essence, they would be covered in these five items. For example, when you're talking about prohibitions in the use of tracking language relative to rental cars, tracking language, just to bring that issue in. With okay. That, if, you want to, if you want to deal with that first, that would be fine with me. Because they just seem to be unfinished business that had been That's started. Fine. So, yeah. you know, I guess in my mind, the prohibition on tracking is, is different than a notice. That's fine. What's your question? I'll start anywhere you like. What I'm trying to do is get us back sure. on, on the track, yeah. no pun intended. Mr. Chairman, I, I apologize. I was not at um, that last meeting, but weren't, uh, my understanding was there were some subgroups put together to look into a couple of issues, and they were going to come back and report on those at this meeting? Uh, well, unfortunately, no one submitted anything by computer or by email, and we have nothing to work on, so I had to start from what I considered scratch and go forward. So what I was hoping was to get back on track, literally, and deal with these issues. Nothing had been submitted, is that correct? And I think Ms. Smarling had asked several times for submissions, and no one had submitted it. So we have to get started. I know that's probably frustrating on your part. It's even more frustrating. Okay. So, what's your pleasure? Would you like, Mr. Barrett, would you like to start with that, with the unfinished business? Would you like to start from that point? I can I can try. Uh, obviously, I wasn't uh, a party at, at that time. As Richard was here, and, and others a party to the substantive discussions on those areas. So, 
Hang, hang me down. What? At this point, I'm, I'm Richard's eyes, because hopefully he'll be on the other end of the phone in a moment. Precisely. Yeah. And uh, it was actually quite good. It was Greg Schultz and I who were working on that, okay. and we've exchanged several emails and several documents, and through this he's actually here today, and mm -hmm. we did not make contact with Sweet. I don't know where he is. So I'm sure. We'll right, and you've had some other problems outside of this commission that you have to deal with. So. Yeah, I, I was not present at the last one. Right. So I apologize if we don't have some final completed language on that. We, we um, have certainly many ideas about it that we'd be happy to share with the commission. But I want to And was there another subgroup as well working on another set of issues, or do you have to understand that? No. Okay. <coughs> That is the unauthorized reading that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Subsequent to the last commission meeting, um, I spoke with the chairman about the possibility of uh, the opportunity at a commission meeting uh, for folks on our end, meaning the retail industry, to make a presentation. And I know there have been some on the technology generally, um, but opportunities for a presentation on exactly how the technology may, at some point in the future, work in a retail setting and the practical applications. So that when we start talking about these, um, there's an understanding of what the realities are um, and, and what really isn't practical and what's not. Um, so, you know, before we get into a substantive discussion in that area and, and act or making decisions at the very least, we, we'd like that opportunity. So my understanding was in that discussion that this meeting was not going to entail a, or include a substantive discussion and decision making <coughs> on, on those items. That's fine. Okay. Point of clarification. Sure. I'm sorry, on, on which items is this? Labeling and deactivation. Or consumer notice, whatever, however we want it to. So, but, but I'm not sure I'm understanding. You're saying that you wanted an opportunity to present that to the House? No, to this, to the study commission. Because we've already had, VPC uh, Global has already done a presentation. There's already been. On the, the technology, but not, it wasn't a, a presentation done by the retail industry, and it wasn't retail specific as far as I'm concerned. And I certainly don't represent the retailers in New Hampshire. Right. From the comment. Isn't it my understanding that the reason we're having lunch here today and planning planned out our whole days is that we're going to try to address those issues? I mean, I, it seemed that the time we made that objection would have been last well, it, month's meeting, and, and or it wasn't at a, last month's meeting when this decision was made. It wasn't and that's a, what we're doing today. It wasn't an objection. The request was made subsequent to the last meeting in preparation for this one, but my understanding was it wasn't 
during that discussion, and Mr. Dumas was present for that discussion as well, that we weren't going to get into substance. So it's not. I could just, I, because I missed the last meeting, but a little bit of a disadvantage, so if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I, it was my understanding that we were addressing those issues today because we're under kind of a time constraint um, with the legislation. Well, we're not. I thought the time constraint was why we're here all day. So, well, no, we're here as long as we want to be. We're under no time constraint other than as much as we can get done by the time the bill reaches the Senate would be favorable because then we can then put those things we thought appropriate you know, on the Senate side as a further amendment. So I would like to get into some kind of basic discussion on some of these issues today. If you feel that it's important that you need to have a presentation by your group, I don't think that that's inappropriate. I don't think that we have to not have a discussion on labeling or consumer notification because we really ought to stake out at least the territory where we feel that we are most. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, could we expect or could we request that anybody who has a presentation get on with it because every time we come here, somebody has a presentation that they want to make, which is delaying the process. This is stringing things up. I get a feeling that this is intentional to delay, to, to get the information out on the bill, because it's just one thing after another after another. I, I detect a, an element of intentional delay. I would like to see people who have these presentations come up and make them now and decide which ones they're going to make and get it over with so that we can move on. That's fine. But it, if I can address that, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, Mr. Chairman, but is it not true that we had a discussion with you several weeks ago about making those presentations at this meeting? It was my understanding that it was not at this meeting, but it would be at a future meeting. Right. right. Well, that was the response that, that we got. Right. That's correct. Right. I thought it was fair. That doesn't preclude us from getting into the discussion That's fine. Label right. And, and reaching some kind of conclusion. Here. We'd like to start with labeling. Right, let's start with labeling. Can you hear us? I could hear someone say, Can you hear it? That's me. Okay. Can you hear people now? Uh, a little bit. Well, they'll speak up into the microphone. Uh, Re Representative Grimley, I'll recognize you, and we'll start with topic A, which will be labeling. Would be uh, labeling? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I feel strongly that some type of identification is necessary uh, for any device or item that comes off the shelf in terms of the consumer knowing that such a device or labeling or an RFID device is present. I feel very strongly that this is necessary for the protection of the consumer. Comment? When we're talking about labeling, we're talking about... Um, Could you, for the, for the oh. uh, identify yourself? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm once sorry. the person that is on the conference call. Sure. Okay. This is Elizabeth Ford from APC Global. Um, I'm interested when we talk about labeling and notice if we're talking about uh, all RFID applications, or are you just talking about products on the shelves? For instance, there are RFID tags in library books, uh, credit cards, hospitals are using RFID identification, uh, states are starting to use RFID in identity documents, and, and we haven't heard from um, these other parts of the industry, other RFID applications, we've only focused my knowledge on products on the shelf, as you just mentioned. So my question is, do you want to see notice on all RFID tags or just those that are on products? Well, I'm particularly concerned about, uh, about identify yourself so that the person on the conference will know who's speaking and then after okay. a while we'll have a handle on it. Dr. Emily, I'm per, uh, particularly concerned about items on the shelf when a person takes the item and removes it from the store. I'm not concerned about uh, pallets and what happens prior to the item going on the shelf. I'm concerned about people leaving a store or, or a vendor and having a tracking device on the item which either is not capable of being removed or deactivated. 
in other words. And in addition, I think any store that has such items should advertise that some of their products may have RFID devices, and then any particular item that has that should be labeled. So now, a library book with an RFID tag in it should, should have a label? Well, they can, they can put a, a, a notice in the library that all library books are going to have RFID tags on them. That, that should be adequate. You don't have to individually, if, if you put a notification in the library that all books in the library will have an RFID tag. Doctor? Yeah, I would actually, um, I, I would like to see in the I, I, Identify yourself. Oh, this is, this is Catherine Albright. Right. And uh, I actually would like to see labels on library books. I, I think what we probably want to look at is the intent of what we're trying to prevent. And I think what we're trying to prevent is people inadvertently carrying around devices that can be used to identify or track them. And so that if that's happening, they know, they can take precautions, they can get a book bag that's lined with, with lead, you know, whatever they want to do to prevent that. But if, if my husband takes a book out of the library and it's linked with his identity, I stick it in my backpack and, and go walking around and there are readers in the environment, then that book could actually be used to track my movements. So I think the, the key here is, is not crates and pallets, I would agree with you there but anything that a person is likely to interact with. And I think one of the, the challenges here is going to be how to, how to define that in the law in such a way that, uh, you know, does that count credit cards? I would say absolutely. You definitely carry those around with you. Does that count um, you know, clothing items? Absolutely. Does that count library books? Sure, because those are things that are small and portable and you carry them around with you. Does that include my Hewlett Packard printer as it sits in my office that's not likely to be carried around? That's a big question mark. So, you know, there's an example where you have a consumer item that may not pose a threat from a, from a privacy standpoint in the, in the library book, for example, would. So I think if we can just address the intent, um, you know, whether we're in agreement that people should be informed that the items that they're carrying have the potential to be remotely scanned by strangers. Mr. Barron, I'd like to make <clears throat> sort of a, a, a global comment, if you will, just to set up the discussion. Mr. Grimley said, on its face, sounds reasonable. But the focus of his comments were the store. And despite the fact that I may sound like a broken record, my one of my main concerns is for the small retail. Uh, over 90% of the member companies of the organization I'm here representing are New Hampshire-based businesses. And many years down the road, when small retailers, small retailers still may not be using this technology in their inventory or point of sale, but they may, and I'm still not sure it's certain, um, anytime soon they will be on item, widespread use on item levels, that that individual store will be left out of the economic system for a variety of reasons. One, that we place liability on the retailer for something that he, he doesn't use, a technology he doesn't use and may not even know is present. Um, and two, the requirement for labeling for something that even if he knows is there, he doesn't place and, and has no, no concern about. Um, I think that's one of many concerns I have when we start to focus on the retailer knowing that you know, um, two blocks away is a place called Audio of New England that sells Onkyo uh, home theater products just like Best Buy in Circuit City in Searswood um, but probably isn't going to use this te technology in before I'm retired. So that, I think that if we can keep that concern in our mind for the end of the session, it would be helpful. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't the solution, wouldn't what you would prefer then be to, to place the labeling burden upon the supplier or whoever it is who originally puts that tag into the item in the first place and makes it available to your local stereo store? Without responding directly, I think that's part of what I'm saying. Mr. Dillard. But that's, it's an item for discussion, yes. Mr. Dillard. I think as a follow-up to that, if you, if you put it back on the manufacturer, and New Hampshire is the only state requiring that, that RFID tagged item that they manufacture to be labeled. They're going to be creating a special label, creating special circumstances for New Hampshire. Most manufacturers in most cases are going to say, your volume in the state is too small.
to warrant doing that, so we're just not going to make that product available in New Hampshire. Then, then would they not make products available to Walmart? Because that is the stated policy of Walmart, that all objects tagged on the item level must be labeled. Not necessarily. Um, my understanding is that uh, in some cases, um, companies like Walmart may, may do a surcharge instead, penalizing the company for not putting it on there. But Walmart actually has a stated policy with their suppliers that, that dictates that they must use an, right. RF, an EPC label in that case because they're using the So in some cases, they, they won't the carry label. a product. Okay. Right. All right. So what we're really talking about is the question of volume. Is that correct? Well, if, if EPC Global's own stated position is that they want labeling, if Walmart's position is that they want labeling, then I don't think that the state of New Hampshire then saying, well, we want labeling too, would somehow make us lose some tiny minority on the whole. Uh, Greg Schultz, uh, providing that we um, don't mainly that it's New Hampshire labeling, because then we're going to have a product with 20 different labels on it. Right. But you can't be too vague either, say, any accepted labeling, because then they can pick the one that's the tiny little RFID, and that's all it says in the back. You know, it, it, it has to be somewhere in the middle. Um. And, um, just, uh, this is Elizabeth Ford again, ABC Global, and I just wanted to say, in reference to what um, uh, Dr. Albrecht said, I don't represent Walmart, but I should say that they're tagging at the case and pallet level, and I understand that there is no tagging um, currently in New Hampshire at Walmart. In fact, I do not know of any tags uh, being used in retail in New Hampshire. I do. You can go into the Staples down on uh, Danny Webster Highway in Nashville, and you can see Hewlett Packard printers, at least last time I checked about a year ago. Hewlett Packard printers with RFID tags on them. In addition, uh, in the Walmart store in, uh, uh, I think right here in uh, Manchester, it's a really good art protest there where RFID tag products at the item level in the Walmart store, clearly labeled with an ABC label as per Walmart's instructions and as per ABC Devil's recommendation. I understand that um, mm -hmm. that's currently not the case, but um, I'll be photo for Mr. Greenwald. Yeah, I don't see why it's such a problem. After all, every product that comes out now has a barcode on it. They print out the barcodes and put it on. What's the difference of putting a barcode or putting a notice saying on the same item that there's an RFID tag there? I mean, it's, it's a printed item warning you. You have barcodes for scanning. It's no difference of just changing the label. I mean, I don't see why you're talking about an, a large additional expense. Secondly, as far as a small vendor is concerned, what does it cost to have a scanner? Scanners are, if, if, they're, if they're reading the barcode with the item coming out, they certainly can afford a 15 or 20 bucks scanner. Well, to address that last week, can I also digress? Identify yourself. Yeah, um, Richard's Curtis. Can you hear us, Richard, by the way? Yes, I can hear you very well today. Thank you. Great. I think to address that last point, if we're talking about the small retailer, I think it's a lot more than just buying the scanner to, to determine if it's there. There's got to be software, database, and so forth. You go up and down Main Street and Concord, and they're still using the punch cash right. registers in many cases, and you get the little paper receipt that's printed out by the cash register that I was familiar with as a kid. So, I mean, if, if, we're, if we're talking about implementing a policy regarding a technology that retailers don't use, that would then cost them a significant amount of money to put in place, that is completely unfair. Right. Um, but what about the question of just putting a label on it? Is that going to cost them anything? The, the, the manufacturer puts a label on it. The item comes with a label saying this is an RFID code. I mean, he doesn't have to do anything. It's there. The person coming in to buy sees that it's, there's an RFID code there, a chip there. That doesn't cost the, the vendor anything. If he's using it to uh, check inventory, that's another story. But the cost, again, it's, it's, I think it's easy to say that. The cost can come in is, is the label that the state of New Hampshire applies different than the label that's currently being used? Is the label that the state of New Hampshire requires different than, than Vermont, Maine, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and all the other 50 states? Now you're adding cost to whomever is putting it on, whether it be the manufacturer, the, the warehouse, or the retail, whomever you assign that to. If it's a different requirement for every single state, it's added cost. Absolutely. Huge. Dr. Albrecht. Maybe, maybe one way to get around that is to say, let's go with one of the industry developed labels, either an EPC label or a uh, global label which were developed by industry. Which, yeah, that's, I think, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Sure, um, it seems to me we're opening up, as we did in the past, different areas that, that need discussion. Um, and the AIM Global symbol, <coughs> I think, is an interesting one. Not an expert. Um, the current 
legislation that's pending seems to move in that direction, and yet this commission has a letter from that organization saying, no, we don't advocate using our symbol or requiring our symbol in legislation. Right. So, and I'm not representing them either, but it's it's an item I think that well, let, me ask the, let me ask the Attorney General's office, do, does, AIM, does AIM have an argument that we can't use their... Their, their label? Yeah. Because they've got some kind of copyright on it? Or? I would suspect. I, I mean, I suppose they could have an argument. It's a reasonable assumption. I think we could ask Dan Mullen, the president of AIM <coughs> that, that's a reasonable I mean, sign. It's a, it's, a, it's a reasonable thought that they may. And I do remember the, the correspondence was that they were feeling very proprietary about their... Mr. Chairman? Yes? May I be recognized? Only if you recognize yourself. I think we know who you are. Thank you. Uh, I, I think the other discussion we had about this was the uh, occasional need that people would have to pay dues or fees. Uh, EBC Global is a fee based organization. Is that right, Elizabeth? Yes. And uh, so when we're talking about any labeling, we want to make sure that we don't force someone to join an organization to get a label. And so when we describe any kind of universal label or, or any, any um, labeling you'd want to discuss, you want to keep in mind there may not be a single label that's used for every single kind of uh, product that's raising these concerns. A library's logo label might be different, something the ALA might come up with. The financial industry might come up and has come up with a logo for credit cards, at least the ones I carry. I think I've shown them to you in committee meetings. It's the three little bow waves that have increased in, in size. So a little a little curve, a little bigger curve, and, a little bar, and then the third curve that shows that it has an RFID included in my credit card. So I, I think we have to remember when we're talking about this that we will need to um, look to the kinds of labels that maybe not prescribe a single one if we are going to go down this path. Well, if you're talking more about the standardization like the mercury labeling on products. Is that correct? Well, I was, I was thinking along the lines that we had to come up with a single like UL label or a single other kind of label that everybody across the whole world recognizes and that different segments of the industry, AIM, EPC, the financial industry, might have their own logo that in indicates RFID, but it wouldn't be the same logo that indicates RFID as the other one uses. Okay. Comments? I was actually present at the unveiling, the initial unveiling of the AIM the AIM global logo in Chicago. Yeah. 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 And in that uh, press conference, what AIM Global explained is that they, I'll give you a little background on it, that they uh, were working with Boeing who had a concern that uh, aircraft parts tagged with RFID might not be identified. And so you, you point a scanner at an aircraft part and you didn't know, if you didn't get a read back, is the tag dead? Is the scanner out of a battery or is there no tag? And so Boeing approached them and said, could you please develop a label for this purpose? Now, AIM Global came up with a couple of ideas and, and uh, their members said, we don't like that, that's not working for us. And then they got together a committee of experts. They brought in uh, graphic designers and all sorts of people and worked for six months to develop this. When they um, announced it, and, and it's, I, I think it's superior to the EPC Global uh, logo for a variety of reasons, um, one of which is that it would apply to anything that's not even EPC tag. Um, but as they explained it, they were making it available free of charge and encouraging, in fact, putting those, those symbols on the internet and encouraging people to download them for any and all purposes. And uh, I had a conversation with them at that time about it. So uh, I think it is superior for a couple of reasons. It's not, it's, if they, I guess if they want to make it proprietary retroactively, that, that's certainly within the scope of what they could do. But at the time, they said, this is not proprietary, wide open standard, anyone can use it. We urge you to do so. And, uh, but the, the reason that I think it is uh, superior to some of the labeling concepts is because within a very small and simple format, they have a way to give technical information about the tax as well, which actually would, I think, be very helpful for people who are concerned about, you know, can my can the tag in my shoe be read by the reader in this particular doorway? Uh, can the tag in my shoe, or the, 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 the retailer's uh, reader that can read the tag in a shoe, can it also read a tag in a credit card? And you would know all of that contained into that very, um, very small, and I think um, the economically designed symbol. 
Uh, it's kind of like, I've said this before in this uh, commission, it's, it's similar to a recycling tag where you, everybody knows the recycling symbol, but then the three or the four or the two or the one may not mean anything to us as consumers, but to the people who actually care about such things, it's, it's very helpful information. So uh, it is my feeling and uh, my strong suspicion that the reason that it's in global, to the extent they don't want us to use it, that uh, pressure has been put on them by industry groups who don't want to see labeling at all, to uh, rescind their earlier offer to make it publicly available, because I was actually there when they did say, we encourage you to use it. And I said, even for, for labeling and consumer products, this would be great. And they said, so nice that we could help you. Representative Winters, you have a comment? Yes. Uh, and the, I've asked Representative Winters to sit in because he also participated on the Congress Committee, and I thought any input you might have would be helpful, without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize I'm not a commission member. I'm not going to vote on anything or anything like that. But I appreciate the opportunity to address the commission. Um, I'd like to agree that the, I think labeling is, is very important for consumers to know what they're buying. Um, and what we discussed in the Commerce Committee as far as our proposed labeling legislation um, was not to require a specific symbol, but more of, you know, perhaps a list of acceptable symbols such as the EPC or the Game Global uh, symbol. Um, or even just uh, a warning notice in text um, that says uh, this product contains an RFID chip that can be read without your knowledge if it is brought within a range of a reader device. So that if someone chose not to use any of those symbols, they still have a, a simple option that they could something, some way that they could comply with the labeling law. Can we pose a question at this point? Uh, the argument is over whether we should or shouldn't label, and I remember dealing with this when it came to mercury products or mercury atom products. And what mystifies me is if we're worried about theft and other problems within the industry, within the retail industry, would not labeling help discourage that? I just want to that out. So in actuality, rather than being a hindrance, I would think that from a commercial standpoint, it would be an added value to have this label. I, uh, this recognize yourself. This is Bob Pernice. Um, are, uh, Mr. Chairman, are you, are you saying that the tag itself could act as an, <coughs> in effect an electronic article surveillance tag? No, no, I'm, I'm saying that it conceivably could act as a deterrence. <coughs> One of the reasons I, I bring this up is I remember an example of where someone would take a TV set out of a store and then they'd come back and then they would try and make a claim that somehow you remember the model. Absolutely. Okay, so a huge, So my, my point being is is that if, if we have these things that are RFID identified, and if you have a label on the product that says uh, RFID identified, maybe it doesn't have to be as long and substantive as Representative Winter's suggestion, but just something that might actually discourage uh, people from uh, taking from thievery. I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. So rather than looking at labeling being negative, it actually almost would be, I think, it would a positive benefit to, to the retail industry. That's great, Schultz. I, I completely agree, except in the next discussion we'll have is keeping track of those tags, which will be in conflict with all the other discussions about knowing what product is where when. I'm glad. I would hate to have it be easy. <laughs> I, I actually would agree with that, but um, yeah, I would prefer to focus on the discussions. I'd be uh, happy to, to contact uh, Dan Mullen, the president of Name Global, to ask him to, to come explain uh, why their standard was developed. Um, it was developed as a standard in manufacturing, which is why it has specific information. It was not developed with the consumer in mind. But they're not made up of industry groups. Uh, and associations the way that EPC Global is are mostly made up of t people who are working on standards for ISO standards. And that um, it's much more of an individual membership organization. And I'd be happy to, to ask Mr. Mullen to explain if his letter wasn't clear why he feels that it's not something that's a consumer friendly logo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Curtis. I think the example of the recycling symbol is a, is a the perfect example of what one of my concerns is. The recycling symbol is accepted universally, literally, across the, at least in the United States. And I'm not aware of everywhere else. But again, the, the current proposals require 
changes to what is currently in practice, if there are either uh, companies on the retail end or um, industry groups that have developed their own symbols and labels that don't conform to this, we're now <coughs> requiring them to create a New Hampshire specific label. And the second thing I'll point out is in, in the current draft, um, some of the things that we've already talked about, especially at the last meeting relative to terminology. The, the label that required in lieu of the, the um, symbol is this specified product type may contain a radio frequency identification chip or other tracking device which contains a unique identification number that can be read without your knowledge if it is brought within range of a reader device. In our mind, it's, it's inflammatory. Um, I think hopefully there's widespread recognition that of the benefits of the technology if and when it becomes widespread on, at the item level. Uh, and the last thing that we would want in the retail industry is to use inflammatory language to scare people away from buying products that contain I buy light bulbs and they have mercury ones. Sure. But I think most people understand what that is. Mr. Grimley. Bob Grimley, uh, I don't see what the problem would be to for any manufacturer that puts an RFID chip in a product to say, generically, this contains an RFID chip. What's the big deal? It doesn't require a national type of thing. It's a simple statement. This contains an RFID chip, period. If they put it in, if the manufacturer puts it in, he can put that label on it. It doesn't require a specific logo or anything else. It's generic. It explains what's there. It tells the consumer, period. It doesn't say it's going to track you. It's not inflammatory. It's information. Mr. What's Mr. wrong Mr. with that? Mr. Mr. Chairman, John Dumas. Um, I think that what's wrong with that is that if New Hampshire is the only state in the nation, or one of maybe five states in the nation that are demanding you have any kind of language on there, and the other states don't, then again, you're forcing that manufacturer to do something special for those smaller number of states, smaller volume states, to put something on the product that they don't have to do in some other. So you're going to add additional cost to the product. Sounds minuscule, sounds very small, but it's going to add up. And and um, you know some manufacturers will probably not distribute that product in those states until there's a whole block, a whole nation doing it. Dr. Albright. I would say that if the advantages to RFID are so great that the entire retail industry manufacturing and everybody else is clamoring to get on board and spending billions of dollars to create this infrastructure, that uh, they, they could probably incur a small printing cost to add something else onto it. I, mean, yeah. I, I, I would say that if the benefit is that great, and the concern, I, which is not just been voiced in this state, but in over close to two dozen states around the country at this point, I think that if we were to develop a standard, that that standard, and I know this because I've been involved with the other states and their legislative processes, that that standard would be picked up and duplicated throughout the country. Mr. Chairman, again, John Dumas, uh, I, I think that. Uh, it hasn't proven out yet to be profitable or worthwhile for most retailers to demand the RFID. I think Walmart has been on the curve of trying to push the envelope to get there, but even they, as I understand it, and I have no direct contact with them for this, but uh, I've heard through, through uh, industry reports and things that they have not found any real value in the RFID tagging at this level yet. Uh, so it's all, you know, certain spent, assuming that something's coming down the line. And you're talking about Walmart being one of the largest of retailers uh, who are requiring this. Again, go back to the mom and pop stores. You know, they're, they're not going to be requiring this. They can't handle it. They're not going to be working with it. So you know, I'm just sensitive to what the cost eventually is going to be to the consumer for this, for implementation by the retailer at all levels. Representative okay. uh, How difficult would it be for the retailers to have sheets of little round tags that they stick on products, especially at the mom and pop level, where they're not doing that many of them. Um, you know, obviously Walmart can afford to have their suppliers do that, but what about the mom and pop stores? Couldn't they, if, if they get products that are tagged, just stick a little round quarter inch tag on it or something like that? A, well, first of all, who's going, to, who's going to be supplying the tags for them, number one? Number two, are they smaller retailer going to always be aware of which what items are required? And number three, they're going to have manual labor costs 
that the larger stores don't have. So you're <coughs> putting the smaller independent at a disadvantage to the larger chains, which is something they're already at a disadvantage to the larger chains. But why? Well, why should government <coughs> force more works. disadvantage on the independent? They're already they're already struggling for survival as it is, and that's our concern as a, an association. We have large and small uh, retailers as members of ours, and and we see the advantages the large chains have already. Uh, we're trying to help protect the small ones, and here this kind of legislation is actually going to say we're going to ca cause you, the small independent, to have even more costs than you have today, because you have inefficiencies in your system already. We're going to add some more. We're going to pass some more on you. I don't think that's fair. Can you get a sense of the cost of a, a current EPC tag on a tube of toothpaste or that it would be viable for a tube of toothpaste? I think that I can, Elizabeth, because we, because we sell them. Um, this is one produced from uh, Nashville. I think for a, for a case in pallet right now, a, a, a typical label is about 12 cents, and that's an artificial price given the fact that the, the cost of the, the inlay that goes into the tag is um, really being subsidized by the, the suppliers. The true cost of the tag, of a commercial tag at this point, and one that's actually been used to show value is probably somewhere in the 25 cent range. So. And doesn't that cost depend a lot on how many you're ordering? Um, it, it does, but again, a lot of the pricing that's, uh, for example, on the sales that are going to the retailers are based on um, the cost of the, the, the RFID tag itself, not necessarily the label. And those prices are, are artificially low at this point simply because um, the manufacturers are looking to see the market, if you will. So. Mr. Chairman? Yes. May I, may I speak? Yes. Um, but as long as you can I, I know we're, uh, we're discussing the labeling, and Catherine a minute ago said, uh, you know, in case a retailer chooses to read this, the tag in her shoe, which is a favorite example she uses. And I, I, I just wanted to uh, have you let me know, we've already gone through the cr criminal, the, consumer, the Computer Crimes Act, excuse me, and decided that very clearly that that was illegal. And we were going to also make sure we had a backdrop against any notice provision to have a general ban on tracking of individuals. And I know we had some discussion that we assigned that to a, a subcommittee of two members of the commission. Mm -hmm. And are we still going to go forward with that portion to make sure that this, the fear we have as to why we want to notice in the first place that we are actually banning that in New Hampshire? Uh, domestic violence, stalkers, criminals typically are not going to be reading. I'm not, I'm not dealing phone. with lawbreakers at this point because I want to make sure we actually are talking about lawbreakers and that we're banning it clearly, that, that there will be against the law so that anybody, we've already established that any legitimate retailer, it will be clearly impossible for them to read anybody's tag that isn't there or they were going to face such a severe penalty. I don't know if you were at the meeting when we went over that, Catherine, but the committee, I thought, as a group, we realized that the New Hampshire law right now will prevent any retailer from reading anybody's tag that isn't there, so much so that we have to talk about an inadvertent read law, otherwise we won't deploy RFID ever in New Hampshire. I'd like to see the domestic violence uh, people in here. I actually was flung to Kansas City to speak at their annual event because they are so extremely concerned about technologies that can be used to track people, and they are the number one uh, proponents right now, I think, around the country in, in several state legislatures. Well, that's exactly what I was trying to narrow this down to. So we've established that the current, current Computer Crimes Act pretty clearly forbids any legitimate retailer, any legitimate business whatsoever from tracking. We also, I thought, wanted to state very clearly in broad terms that tracking of individuals by any means was against the law. So that if this were discovered, if someone were doing this, say, to stalk a person, and it were discovered in time, you could prosecute that as a crime against that person who was trying to track an individual uh, using um, electronic means. Well, Richard, the, the problem is, is, is lots of people get prosecuted for killing people that they've stalked, and that doesn't seem to serve as a So you're opposed to actually making tracking illegal in New Hampshire, or are you just trying to finesse this question? I'm confused. Well, Richard, you're, you're actually finessing it into something other than what we're discussing is labeling, and I'm trying to justify why I think it's important that people should know if the things that they're wearing could be used to track or stalk or identify them. Whether it's legal or illegal, I think is irrelevant to the point that it's possible 
and that there are lawbreakers out there, we're all aware of their existence, who would use the technology in that way. The fact that they will go to jail after doing so is not going to protect the woman who's fearing for her life and that of her children. There are so many ways to track that are not RFID, they should be fearing for their life anyway if they have a stalker after them. That's why we have protect your borders and shelters, and we have uh, other mechanisms for protecting people. Well, I'm I don't understand, uh, I just really was asking the chairman, Mr. Chairman, you designed that to a subcommittee. Did the subcommittee report, I believe it was made up of Ms. Albrecht and someone else, who was supposed to bring back our general prohibition against tracking. Did they report? No, not yet, because there were some... Uh circumstances outside this commission that did not allow them to finish their work. What I'm going to do is finesse this conversation back to the concept of products that have RFID chips or don't have RFID chips. It goes strictly to the retail question. And I would like the, the commission to look at very simply, if we have a product that has an RFID chip implanted into it for tracking purposes, whether we think it's good or bad, should the public have some kind of notification, yes or no, and I think that's the case in point. We all have agreed that if someone abuses the, the RFID through, through a tracking device that they are subjected to upwards to a Class B felony. So I would like to get back to the actual product, and I would like to make a comparison to it as to other sort of labeling when it comes to toxics or anything else on a, on a container. Now the question I have been raising in my mind is, if we have something that already has a RFID tag implanted in it, let's say a television set or any kind of product of any nature, is it not fair, yes or no, to notify the public that there is that kind of a device? That's, I think, where we have to get back to. Well, if I could respond to that, I, I think we've talked and had some ideas that if, what, what the right response uh, in general to that is given other examples we've used. And the first one I think we've talked about is the need to have some kind of flexibility in how the notice is given. And uh, and uh, part of it is because we don't have a, we may not end up with a true universal logo for every single kind of product that we're dealing with or every single kind of device that contains RFID. And we might also not, a, a, a specific label may not be the best notice in some cases. Well, certainly, I agree with you, certainly not in the near future. Uh, Fifteen years ago, People said that that was the case for microchips when it came to animals, and yet we now have pretty much a standardized format for microchips. So, you know, I'll grant you that, that there isn't a uniform logo or label at this point. Nevertheless, we still have a, an item that is implanted in another item, and the concern is, should people be notified? Is this a reasonable thing or not? We have two levels. We have the Walmart scenario, and then we have the local retailer scenario. So at some point, there ought to be a threshold that says that we don't want to impinge upon the small retailer. Yet, if that small retailer is buying a product that Walmart also retails, and that has a microchip in it, would it not be fair to say that that product should have a label on it? Well, I, I guess we do think there should be a threshold, but we've talked about a threshold where until there's enough goods in the stream of commerce, what John was talking about, I think, with you know, when there's not enough goods, what Curtis was raised, where there's not enough goods in the stream of commerce so that New Hampshire stands out, it will be potentially disadvantageous to New Hampshire retailers to require this or to other businesses. Once there are enough goods in the stream of commerce so that this becomes more routine, then such a, a notice requirement would make more sense because there's enough stuff out there you can actually start building manufacturing capacity and then everyone begins to do it, then you could start talking about a sunrise of a, some kind of notice that would make make more sense. If there's just a few goods in the stream of commerce going to a few places, then mandating notice for essentially all the goods in the country uh, may, not, may not work. I, I don't disagree with you, but what I'm talking about is if there's a product that already has something implanted in it, and those people are marketing that product, would it not make sense that they be required to put a label on there saying that there's an RFID chip? I'm not talking about a basket of goods. I'm talking about an individual item. Let's say a television set or a tube of toothpaste. Well, Phillips. Well, what well, I, well, I guess uh, no, no, I think wait, we've wait. always maintained the principle that whoever actually attached, embedded, or incorporated into packaging the actual device under EPT guidelines, they are responsible for uh, any 
EPC guidelines labeling. So if you're going to try to stat, put that in a statute, I think the whole principle of the, the entity that's re, that actually does this would be the responsible party. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll open the floor to comment with Mr. Dumas. Uh, John Dumas, and again, uh, as I was talking before about the small independent retailer having a problem with this, the same would be true for the small independent manufacturer. Uh, there may be some small manufacturers out there, you know, a small New Hampshire business, startup business, just trying to get going on in, in it, and they may be uh, trying to to satisfy a customer like a Walmart or something, and, and try and put a RFID tag in that. If New Hampshire is the only one mandating notification of some type, and the other states aren't, you're again putting that particular manufacturer, <coughs> small mom and pop manufacturer, at a disadvantage to a large <coughs> one who's. Phillips is, is TV is going to be doing for all the TVs anyways. You know, they have less of a problem with it than a small independent would have. Representative Kale. Uh, with all due respect, if they're large enough to supply to Walmart, they're not a small independent manufacturer. That's not I, true. I don't think <laughs> that's one, one at a time for Mr. Barry and then Mr. Schultz. I, I, I'm fairly certain that that's not necessarily the case. Um, and I can only say it's not on point, but uh, Walmart, um, buys from a lot of local vendors, right. particularly in the produce section, but in many other areas as well, locally produced products. So Walmart, um, at Walmart New Hampshire, may sell products that are relatively local and differ a lot than what you might find in a Walmart in Arizona when when you're visiting. That's correct. Somewhere else. So that, that's not necessarily true. Um, actually, one, I want to make one comment, and I got a question for the whole committee. And one is, um, Whenever there's an entity doing some sort of pilot or project or something, that's kind of what, how I describe this, you were even saying, you don't know the artificially low prices are low because you want to see how it's going to flush out. One of the things in retail is, what is the consumer tolerance for that? The only way you're going to know that is if you say, hey, consumer, here's a product with this, are you still willing to buy it? So that advocates for definitely putting labels on it. And if they still buy it, you've proven that it's worth it and it's good. If they stop buying it, then it's like, oh, there's no consumer tolerance, let's drop it. So that's a comment. But the question I have is all the other um, labeling we've talked about, one that comes to mind is I buy an extension cord and it says it contains a material known in California to cause cancer. Specifically mentions California, and it's anywhere in time. And aside from the mercury and all these other ones, so you have the barcode, you have the recycling, you have the lead, you have the mercury. How did they grow? This is a question. How did they grow to the point where now they are an product? Did it start with a state like us who said it's got to be? Did it start with um, retailers with UPC codes saying we need a standardized way of tracking it? And it just became prevalent. I mean, which way did these things go? Why couldn't we kind of use that as a model? Uh, yeah. um, anyone wish, I, would, I, I don't have an answer to that, but my assumption would be that a, a state the size of California uh, has enough volume of, of product being sold that they can mandate and manufacturers will listen to a state the size of California and say, okay, we've got to, if we want to sell that much volume, California is going to require this, that labeling will work. But now New Hampshire wants to do the same type of labeling, <laughs> forget it. It's not going to happen. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the problem, is that for small states, they're not going to bow to a small state as much as a large state. Well, what's California's stance on RFID? I thought they made a statement about this. I didn't mean, talk about it in here. Well, let me go back to, if I may, let me go back to the very, I'm going to throw mercury back at you. We get, <coughs> probably end up buying one by the time we get done discussing it. <laughs> Look, Vermont required a mercury label on light bulbs. It was taken to court. NEMA, which was the National Electric Manufacturers Association, sued them, and they lost. In other words, in, in uh, appeals court, Vermont was upheld. Vermont's a small state. Now, at that time, people like Sylvania did not want to put a mercury label on their long tubes. At the same time, Phillips did. So there was a product choice there. At least you know, one company said they wanted to, another company said they didn't. The minute Vermont did that, Sylvania started putting labels on their product because they still wish to sell their product in Vermont as well as in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and other places. So my point is, is that I, I don't think that the question of New Hampshire being a large or a small market really holds all that much water. I think what's more important is that if a standard is set, if people are doing something, they have a product that's, that contains something, that fair warning should be applied to the public. This is just the way I feel about it. Whether it's toothpaste, whether you have a light cord that, that might 
be considered toxic in California as opposed to somewhere else, uh, a standard is set. Uh, I only think that it would be reasonable that if an RFID chip is put in a product, that a fair notice ought to be made and it ought to be said that there is an RFID chip in that product. I, I just don't see a problem with that, personally. Uh, this is Bob Bernice. I think at this stage of the game, particularly where um, you know, we're, we're looking at, at uh, trying to do something with the technology, which really is in an inchoate stage, um, it's probably important to, to recognize the distinction between what's being tagged right now right. and for what purpose. There's a vast difference between, say, a case of product or a pallet of product that's being shipped to Walmart and another product that has an RFID tag embedded in the product that would lead the store. Indeed, at this point, very little that's being tagged is leading the store. Okay. Um, however, in the stuff that may be tagged that is leading that is leading the store. Okay. Either on a, what's considered an item level or a case level, and what's actually tagged inside the product, there are different reasons for doing that. So I think it's probably important to look at why someone might tag a particular item itself that would come out of the box and go on the shelf or walk around in your pocketbook or something like that. And another item that's shipped in as a retail item that's going to be taken off a case or taken off a pallet has a tag on it that's a label on the exterior of the box that will be discarded when the box is, you know, the product is taken out. There's a, there's a big difference now. There's a lot of tagging happening. And when I say a lot of tagging, it's, it's relatively small but it's happening on the case and pallet level. There is some item level uh, uh, product tagging happening, but a lot of it is for management within the establishment itself. There's a lot of item level tagging that's happening for work in progress that never leaves the factory. Um, it might, and that's what I think we have to look at, but at the same time, I think at this stage of the game, we probably need to see why this kind of, kind of tagging is being done and why this type, type of tagging is being done Clearly, if something has a label put on it and it's identified the way EPC identifies it, that label can be removed. But an item that has been tagged for another reason other than we're shipping it to a retail outlet and we want to see what, this, what it looks like in the supply chain, clearly there are reasons for doing that. I think that's a very important distinction at this stage of the game. I would agree with you. So what you're saying is, is that, that just for inventory control, something that's at a wholesale level, doesn't necessarily have to be, because that's internalized within the system, and it hasn't reached the consumer yet. So the consumer's not harmed at that point. Is that correct? Well, yeah, and, and as, as far as I know, and, and you, you may have different examples of this, but um, I think that you've, Catherine, you've alluded to some of these sometimes, but if someone is shipping, say, for example, something to Walmart, <coughs> that's a case, and products come out of the case, the products that come out do not have a tag on them. There may be, or a label on them, that says we ship this to Walmart. There may be items that are considered items, like an HP printer, that does have a label on the outside of the box. But when you take that printer out of the box, you're, you're no longer tagging it. Now, if they're tagging it internally, that's for a different reason. Well, so, so now we've, we've kind of reached a, 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 a reasonable baseline that if, it, if that tag accompanies the product on a retail level, then it would be reasonable to label it. And usually it's labeled by, I mean, the, the retailer at this, excuse me, the manufacturer or the, uh, the supplier, whoever that might be, from Walmart's standpoint right now, is the re one responsible for doing that. The, the suppliers indeed, as this technology grows and proliferates, may find advantages on their own for doing it. But right now the reason they're doing it from the supply chain standpoint is because they're being asked to do it. So that, that all focuses back on who is doing the tagging and why are they doing it. And I think that that's important for us to look at right now. Because I think it's very difficult to make a global statement about anything that has a tag and it has to have notification. It really depends on why I think people are doing that. Uh, Bob Grimley, um, if it's on the pallet and it never gets on the, on the shelf, that's not a problem. The problem is if something arrives on the shelf with an RFID chip in it, the consumer should be notified, period. If yeah. it's on the pallet, the consumer never sees it, and it's of no concern to the consumer. No, but I think what I'm, do, what I'm trying to do is go inside the box. Right now, it may be on the box that right. the item is being shipped in. And if it's an EPC tag, it is noticed. It is labeled. 
this device, I don't even know what the exact Well, I see no is. reason why it still can't be labeled. It, it contains a chip. If the person throws the box away later, it's just like having a, a, a tag on a, on a blouse. No, I, I don't think so, because the tag, if the tag is not on the item in the box, then you're not tagging the item, you're tagging the box. And the, tracking the, the, box. the item is in the person is removing the box from the Different. store. The person is not removing, taking the box from the item and removing no, it. No, my point is the box is labeled. Fine. The box, the is, box labeled. is labeled that it contains a chip. That, that, that's fine. By EPC standards, it is. Yeah, that's and fine. That's, that's what I'm saying. And yeah, this from a conversation is, is going on a little bit too free for all here. Uh, is, we, we're still going to go in recognition oh, okay. of this, this individual conversation, if, if, if you don't mind. We're, that's we're, fine. We just won't go with that free flow at, at this point in time, if that's okay. article in my hand from the RFID journal dated December 17th, 2007 that uh, I would have brought at the last meeting and uh, it is underscoring one of the concerns that I think the public needs to have about this technology. This article says Rapplatac, which is an RFID uh, producer, <coughs> releases RFID tags with built-in EAS or electronic article surveillance and that -like technology. Uh, Rapplatac is now joining Checkpoint Systems Inc. and uh, Sensormatic two of the companies that essentially sew up the EAS industry for anti-theft and retail stores, and now offering RFID tags that can be incorporated directly into items. Now, the reason this is so worrisome, I believe, is that if you put an RFID tag, and this is where um, you know, Richard, I keep coming back to the shoe, Checkpoint Systems in one of their promotional uh, images has a shoe with an RFID tag in it. Philips Electronics, IBM, other companies have talked about readers in the floors that could read those tags. So if that's not my example, Richard, that is uh, the industry's example. So the concern here is that you have tags, EIS tags, by design, by definition, are designed to be hidden inside the products uh, through source tagging and the like. Now, these things are costing 25 cents a piece. They're now not only, and this, this is to get back to that issue of what they cost, you know, you're talking about a pretty substantial increase in the cost of something. If you're spending 25 cents to embed something in somebody's shoe, you could probably spend another fraction of a penny to put a little bit of ink on there or put some kind of something in your uh, fabrication plan to address that. So this is now the third example, a very recent one, just within uh, just a couple of weeks ago, of people designing these exact tags to be placed into consumer products. Now, you're talking, Curtis, about how these have not yet entered the, uh, the, the mainstream. We don't know that. Do you know the, the last pair of shoes that you bought, whether or not it has an RFID tag in it? And if so, how do you know that? Have you had an x-ray? Because source taggers right now are trying to promote this technology, and we have no way of knowing because there's no requirement for them to disclose who their clients are, whether Checkpoint Systems has one, five, fifty, or five hundred clients that are actually taking them up on what they're now offering on the open market, which is hidden RFID tags in your shoes. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to respond to your question, I'm fairly comfortable. There's not one there. Um, but a, a small digression, I think that's why it's important to address uh, covering the act of tracking somebody, as has been addressed. Whether I know it or not, if I discover it later that it's happened, uh, there's nothing that we're talking about at this point, because it's been put aside, that allows me to um, create a civil action or allows the state to go after them criminally. I mean, if, if I wasn't clear, I can <coughs> phrase. I, I if I, I walk guess, in... I guess, I guess I'm trying to understand the difference between sort of the after-the-fact prosecution, which is, I think, the, the, the uh, distraction that Richard was trying to lead us down, and the issue of labeling if something contains an RFID tag. I, I, have, I have no problem with people being prosecuted for abusing the RFID tags in there in the first place, but I believe I should have some right to protect myself and not have to rely on an after-the-fact uh, remedy. Well, I'm curious about how... Um, here's the example you gave, how labeling helps in the case of uh, the, the domestic violence stalker uh, issue. How is labeling going to help that person? I'm, I'm just trying to catch up with how labeling relates to the discussion in that case. Well, the, the idea of labeling is if I am in fear of my life and I, there are known people who would stalk or threaten me, then I would make a point of either A, not buying products containing that label, or B, if that's all I could find, I would make a point of making sure that those tags have been deactivated. I would be much more cautious about those, those things and more aware of them. So, so the theory is that the, the stalker is somehow going to place readers in a bunch of different places and know somehow that a particular EPC 
number is associated with the person that's the object of their stalking or hunt, and that somehow they'll know when that when that person goes by there with a product, assuming they get a read, that that person is at that location. That's the theory. That, that's one of the threat models. Yes. Well, that's <coughs> impossible. <laughs> I'm sorry, Richard. I think that's impossible to do. Uh, Excuse me. Gregory, um, that's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask is, I, I think we could probably come to a quicker resolution on whether or not to label and how to label it. If we could define, which is unfortunately more a technical question, how it could be used for a threat. If we agree it can be used for a threat, then okay, what are the threats? Here's what and how we tell people to avoid that risk. If we agree it can't be used as a threat, then while I would still personally like to see a label on it, I don't think it's as much of a mandate or requirement to be so globally recognizable or required. Um, I, you know, when we've talked in this um, venue, I, I see, I've heard of about three particular different types of threats. One is the, you know, walking down the street, somebody's out your bag or whatever. Another one is the big companies. And the other one is things like DHS and Patriot Act type scenarios. Um, well, I would agree with Richard that the first one I just mentioned, it, it's not going to happen. We're not going to have people being tracked by zapping bags here, there, and everywhere because you never know where to look for somebody. There's a pretty good chance that you can phys physically, visibly see somebody much further distance than you can by getting your RFID check. Number two, big companies. Um, we would like to believe that the big companies can follow the laws, therefore, you can be honest. And number three, I think, is a much bigger question, and I personally don't like the idea of putting too much restriction and mandate on technological growth in a small state like New Hampshire in order to thwart what bigger government is doing outside of our control. I don't think we should let those things happen, but I don't think stopping it here for that risk is really where that conversation belongs. There should be other legislation lobbying to stop the government from being able to do things like that. So those are, if we can define threat factors, I think it's probably the most, uh, I, I'm an engineer, an electrical engineer, and while I'm not planning to stalk anybody anytime soon, but things to read these, uh, the, the electronics to read these are simple and cheap. And I could do it, I could probably come up with a reader in a couple of days. I'm sure that people could go out and buy them off of the internet. There's probably designs published on the internet to come up with readers that somebody could scatter around the city. It's not that difficult. And while it may seem far-fetched now, it's not expensive, and somebody who's determined to stalk somebody could easily get a hold of the technology. I agree. I just think that there are so much easier ways to do it today, and most likely going into the future, because, I mean, you can hire somebody to do it for, you know, have much an hour, and the amount of time and effort it would take them to do the other scenario. It just, it just seems like there's much easier ways to do a stalking scenario. Uh, just a couple of comments on, on things we've heard. Uh, we've often heard uh, this idea that some companies are implanting tags and shoes. Uh, to my knowledge, that is not being done anywhere, in, in not only in the U.S., but in the world. And I think we should hear from the apparel manufacturers of America if that's happening. We could ask Timberland here to talk to us about if that's happening. I do, don't think any shoe manufacturers are doing that or have plans for it. And I'd like to, to hear from that industry. Uh, as um, Mr. Pernice was saying, tags are now at the case and palette level. We have had a few examples in the United States of item level tagging. And the tags have all been on <coughs> packaging. There's a lot more item level tagging in Europe, uh, clothes, and all sorts of items. To my knowledge, there has never been a, case, a tracking case associated with these tags in Europe. Uh, just one of the points I'd like to throw out there. Lauren, do you have a... I was just going to make a point that I'm not sure we should look, the focus should be through a threat lens, if you, if you will, but I think rather a privacy interest in general consumer protection principles of disclosing mm -hmm. uh, what is actually there. So, I mean, I think maybe the threat is a part of the privacy piece, but... Um, That's what I said I would like to have them anyway, but we talked a lot about the other whys. So. Right, so. right. 
but I, I think that's that's narrower than the bigger piece of you know the privacy interest or is it does it just amount to good pr consumer protection to make a fair and accurate disclosure about something that's going to be fine whether it's you know this is made in Scotland as opposed to Thailand or you know this contains mercury or or this contains a particular chip that's capable of certain things could be capable mm -hmm. And I think it's hard to sit here now to know what the technology is going to be in two years, never mind 15 years, um, regarding scanners or readers or how it's going to develop. Mr. Grimley? Bob Grimley, uh, to me it's just a simple statement. Do I, as a consumer, <coughs> have a right to know that there's a tag there? Is it my right to know? Is it also my right to remove it if I wish? It's a very simple statement as a consumer. Not the businessman. You're putting a product on the shelf. Do I have a right to know that you put an RFID chip there? Secondly, do I have a right to remove it if I don't want it? I can see some uses of having an RFID chip. For example, in tracking drugs and making sure that there are no counterfeit drugs. Very useful thing for the consumer. On the other hand, whether it's in or out of the package, it doesn't matter. If it says it's an RFID chip, this is a guarantee that this is a, tr a product produced by an, an ethical pharmaceutical organization. Here is a chip. The manufacturer and other people have used this. It contains a chip. You open the package to throw the box away. It's, it's resulted in a very useful purpose. On the other hand, if it's embedded in a piece of clothing and, and I am not told, then my privacy has been invaded. So I think there are, there are certainly good uses for RFID chips. But the question really is, do I have the option as a citizen, as a consumer, to know it's there and to remove it if I wish? Period. If I may at that point. Sure. To, to jump in on that, it always mystified me uh, six or seven or eight years ago when the, the battery lobbyists would come in and say, well, we can't put a mercury warning on a battery because, A, we couldn't put it on a little battery. And yet, at the same time, and this follows up with what Mr. Grimley is saying, at the same time, those same battery packets would have contains lithium. It would be just that simple. So to me, if the product contains an item, why can't a label on that item say, there's an RFID tag or there isn't an RFID tag? It's just very simple. That takes it away from being a burden on small retail. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I ask a question or respond to that? Sure. Um, it, let's just say for a period of time that, that all batteries had the same basic formula, say it lasted for 20, 30 years, and, all, and it got to a point where after it was first in innovation, all batteries contained mercury. Um, is there a point where, he, where we would think it becomes pointless to label them until the formula changes? In other words, there's a threshold where if there's so many products with RFID in them, there is a point where one can assume there is an RFID tag involved. At that point, labeling everything to say RFID included becomes redundant. Well, that very the well level may, where we think that's true. Well, that very well may be 50 years from now, but at this point, the real argument was they were actually removing mercury from batteries, and in actuality, uh, they were adding lithium and replacing them. So it was really critically important to understand that you still had some batteries out there that had a mercury content. Sure, I, I understand that it, 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 when things change. So if, if a new kind of, you know, equivalent of RFID comes out, you would you might require a different kind of notice at that point. I'm just wondering if the point reaches the threshold where something like over half the products contain an RFID device, are we still going, or it gets to where 100% of the products contain an RFID device, are we going to continue to require a notice? Well, you're actually arguing labeling based on a basket concept, and I'm merely arguing labeling based on a content concept. That no, no, I understand. I was just trying to analogize it to, to this question I have about, is there, we talked about the possibility of having thresholds that passed in committee meetings. Right. At the, what's the point where you might start having notice? What's the point where you don't need notice anymore? And I'm just raising that at the point of discussion. Okay, well, personally, I would say that, that uh, if it's done on a wholesale level where, where a company or a, a grocer's group or someone is basically wanting to keep track of pallets, I really don't think it's important that, that 
it be labeled or, or tracked other than internally. But if I buy a product and it has a component in it, I think that courtesy dictates that I should be notified that it has a label on it. Now, I'm not putting that back on the, the small retailer because I don't think the small retailer really has any control over that one way or the other. I think that it's quite frankly uh, up to the person that's manufacturing the product, regardless of the size of the component, to identify just exactly what's in it. It's no different than putting, we have so much content, so much fiber, so much cotton, so much wool in a, in a garment. Well, right underneath that, this garment contains an RFID tracking device. Pretty simple. Now, 50 years from now, when it becomes so commonplace and, and Representative Kirk has one implanted in his earlobe, it probably won't be necessary. <laughs> Does that make sense? Is that while I'm still alive, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't get into that. Can we just say cover your dead body? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, I, yeah, I believe that's not. illegal in New Hampshire yeah. to read the legislation <laughs> we're recommending. Exactly. I guess, Mr. Varn, I'm not as panicked because I think it's not commonplace, and therefore, because it's not commonplace, it's necessary. No, I wasn't talking about it now. I understand your point. I was just, uh, there, there will come a time where, where it might look kind of silly that we're requiring a notice. I just wanted to think about having a potential sunset on any uh, notice we talk about to say at some point we just might not need it, just like barcodes in use would be a silly thing to say today. Uh, at one point someone have... wanted to do that, mandate a notice for barcodes in, in stores. Right. This, this John Excuse Dumas. Me, Mr. Dumas. Yes, this is John Dumas. Um, I, I think when we first had a, one of our first meetings of uh, this committee, we talked about are we going to create legislation for RFID or for all technologies that might come out in the future because they're changing? And I don't think you're going to see RFID in, 20, in 50 years. I think it'll be as old-fashioned as barcodes are. Uh, that, that they're going to become obsolete and there's going to be some new technology out there. So maybe a gas, gaseous or something else. Yes. And that I, the first thing is I think that we, whatever we do, we shouldn't be targeting RFID, but it should be targeting the, the aspect of uh, any kind of uh, information device that, that's out there, Re remotely readable device. I yeah, think. Uh, I think this is this is interesting. That excuse me, that, Please, I, you're, that, you're the chair. So. <laughs> that that uh, th this is really showing the difficulty of dealing with this issue because even though we spent a lot of time deciding that we would go to a more generic term in re terms of re referring to these kind of devices, where we're we re already yeah. reverted back. Uh, and we're having an extremely difficult time trying to use the terminology which we're promoting to the legislature in terms of what we think that it should be used so that we wouldn't constantly be dealing with this question of uh, the technology of today or the technology of tomorrow. Right, right. We're, trying to, we're trying to supersede that. Right. I think at any rate we might make a real strong effort, and I know it's not easy, to go at, at least in, in, in this group with the terminology that we've already agreed that is more appropriate. So if we could at least try to, when we're discussing these remotely readable devices, to use that terminology, uh, we might uh, alleviate some of this discussion about some specific uh, technologies. Would RRD be acceptable? Could we shorten it to RRD? Oh, if you want to go to RRD, uh, yeah, for, for internal purposes, yeah. yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just have a procedural point that um, is Mr. Barry or is Mr. Barn representing your organization today? As far as, for example, a vote? As far as even speaking or participating <laughs> in the meeting? I suppose that's a good question. I, but, I, I mean, I'm not going to speak for the chair, but. In many cases, members of the audience, and if I were, I'd, I'd be out there, have been recognized to speak. As far as an official vote, that'll be Richard. Richard's not here, he can't see what's going on, so. Can I, can I call in remotely next time and bring somebody else to consider I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure the commission <laughs> will allow you to do that, Richard. Can we all call in remotely? Can <laughs> 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 let our proxies just, just fight this one out? Do you have a question, Mr. Um, I, I do have a comment, but I, I, I will uh, delay it a little bit if that's okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one brief comment. Uh, Mr. Dennis has pointed out that the RFID being very old uh, very quickly. 
and so many new technologies coming on board, I think that um, set, that says to me that we need to address the behavioral issues. What is the behavior that we're trying to prevent? It's tracking. We want to stop that. And that's where our focus should be and not on a specific technology because he's absolutely correct. There are many developments. Things are moving very quickly in that area. But if the right laws are on the books addressing the behavior that we don't want to see, well, I think the behavior we're discussing right now is the act of uh, tagging items without telling the consumer, and that's the behavior that we're addressing now. And we've already addressed the behavior of whether uh, their stalking is illegal, basically, which we already know is illegal. But the behavior we're addressing right now is whether consumers should know if product is tagged or not. And notice is on, on I, I, are well, no, notice isn't on every product or else we wouldn't be discussing this. Are there tags that, that don't have any sort of notice on them? I, I, I don't I, I'm not aware of any. I would like to hear about that. I'm not I'm not aware of any, but that doesn't necessarily mean there aren't there aren't. You mean is there any illegal activity going on? Right here, right now. <laughs> um, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, John Dumas again. Um, I, again, I, I think we, we should be going back to uh, the fact of, of um, can, what kind of what kind of impact it will be to the consumer. And, and I would agree that that we, we should be focusing in on should there be notification to the consumer or not. And, and, and I think that it is appropriate to do that. However, at what cost and what impact it would have on our economy? Now, I'll, I'll just, I just I'd like to digress for just one minute uh, to some other testimony that I've given to several committees here on a tobacco issue. And uh, the fact is that uh, uh, last year the legislature passed a uh, request by the fire chiefs to have a uh, self-distinguishing cigarette go out there. And it, uh, everyone said it was benign, wasn't going to have any impact on anything. In fact, it, it's reduced tobacco sales by 75% in many cases. Yeah. Just that one item, because the, the person who smokes, the perception is that it's a different product. And they go out of state, they go internet, they go somewhere else. And the state revenues are down by $7.5 million for the first six months of the biennium for the, for the, uh, the fiscal year. That's substantial, and that's because there's a perception out there, and it, was, it wasn't going to cost the industry anything, didn't, the prices of the product didn't go up or anything else. But sales are down that much. The same thing can happen with this, and I don't want to be a scare tactic, I don't want to you know, suggest anything, but our industry, the, the grocery industry, is, is uh, very much on the perception of cross-border sales. 40% of our sales come from out of state. And if we start having additional cost to a product, or a different differential to a product that they don't have to have in other states, <coughs> you're going to impact those cross-border sales. And those cross-border sales affect state revenues. Not only in that product, but all related products. Are you suggesting that cross-border sales has reversed and, and now that people are crossing the border into Massachusetts Absolutely. In, in order to get cigarettes? Absolutely. Which, uh, which uh, don't have this uh, automatic extinguishing uh, well, mechanism? In? No, what happened was Massachusetts went one month after us. So for one month, they could get them in Massachusetts, they couldn't get them in New Hampshire. The Massachusetts people who were coming to New Hampshire decided, well, we'll buy them in Massachusetts now, and now they're finding that, well, there's no difference, why should I go to New Hampshire anyways? I'll keep buying in Massachusetts. We've lost a substantial amount. You, you broke a pattern. Huh? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's what I'm concerned about with any kind of thing that's going to affect the consumer in the same way. I believe there should be some notification, and I think the best kind of notification is where the manufacturer who wants to encourage people to buy their product because they know they have an RFD chip, chip in it and can, can dismantle it, they should have the right to dismantle it, you know, that's fine. Uh, that manufacturer should do that. But if we're going to mandate to some small manufacturers who can't afford to do this or comply with these regulations, and it's just New Hampshire, those products aren't going to be available in New Hampshire, but they will be available in Massachusetts. And when they're available in Massachusetts, we're going to lose some more business, cross-border sales. Is it not the manufacturer's choice to put this chip in? It is. Okay, then the manufacturer is assuming the responsibility and the cost. This consumer isn't demanding that he put it in. The manufacturer of his own free will is putting this chip in and is assuming the cost, which he may pass on to the consumer. Mr. Chairman, 
Uh, or is the one follow-up to that? Yes. Uh, that's true. It, it would be up to the manufacturer to determine whether they want to put the cost into it or not. But if New Hampshire is the only state requiring it, well, then well, we're, we're not requiring it. Well, Mr. Let's not have interruptions, I would, I would suggest that if it was on a national scale, and that it was something that was uniformly like the plastic coating or the uh, uh, content coating of clothing, or the, the cotton, whatever, whatever the federal requirements are, if, if RFID was, re uh, not RFID, excuse me, if uh, the notification was responsible uh, at a federal level, all states would be uniform, yeah, absolutely. But when New Hampshire tries to do something different, then we're going to lose that differential cross-border sales. Um, I think I, um, I want to put a, a finer point on what I was trying to make before. Perhaps I didn't explain myself well, but, but I, I think that um, you know, I've heard within this uh, commission there are a number of people who believe very strongly or perhaps not so strongly that notification should be part of, part of this. And I think that we're going to decide on that or at least militate to some kind of decision there. But I really think that what would help push us forward is, uh, because right now what we're arguing, arguing about is maybe not necessarily that notification is the right thing to do, but what the impact of that would be. And there's a very, very big difference between, I'll, I'll just think of an example, a retailer down the street who is selling, we'll use an HP printer, okay? A retailer down the street who is using an HP printer that has a tag on the box and a retail, or in Walmart, who is using the same printer that has a tag in the box. Now let's assume for a minute that it even has a tag embedded in the device. I don't know if that's happening, but uh, let's just take it for, to, uh, to, that, to that extreme. I believe there's a very, very big difference between uh, what's happening with the tag that's on the box and what is happening with the tag that would be uh, inside the device. And what I mean by what's happening, what the intent is, okay? so. So a manufacturer decides to tag both its box, okay, let's just say HP now, and its device. It's tagging its box to Walmart because Walmart wants them to tag it. And clearly on that box is a tag that says this contains blah, blah, blah. HP for cost advantages may say, you know what, we'll tag everything just because it's cheaper to do that from a box standpoint. Mr. Retailer down the street gets that box. It's tagged. There's no cost there. It's labeled. There's nothing, there, you know, there's, there, there's nothing that he has to do. It's already done. The consumer can walk out of the store and tear that label off and they're done. Now, the difference is why is the tag inside the printer? Why is the, why is the uh, uh, printer guy doing that? What is he getting out of it? And if he's doing it for his own benefit, then maybe you're right. The cost of doing that is, falls back on him. I think there's a very important distinction there. And it might be a place to jump off from, from, from the notification standpoint. Mr. Schultz, did you May I ask a question about that, what was just said? Mm -hmm. Sure. sure. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I, if I understand it, there's a distinction being made between, like, something that would be done as part of packaging, and like with the HP printer, that they might come up with a scheme where they would put an RFID in their ink cartridges or some component that goes inside the printer that might assist them with uh, refurbishing the printer later or dealing with recycling or something else. But it would never be part of the EPC uh, scanning system. So it's never going to be associated with the sale. It's just simply part of the product, much like the automobile people are thinking of that. Is that the kind of scenario you were talking about? I couldn't fully hear you very well. Sure, sure. That's... That's, that's one of them. I mean, I just use the HP printer because we know that that's about as close to item level on retail that we get right now, other than um, in Europe on garments and things like that. But I was just trying to simplify the example. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Maybe we could bring this conversation just back to what I think is the fundamental issue and the reason why the legislation was introduced in the first place and the commission was, was formed, and I, I think you put it very well is it, does a consumer have the right to know if an RFID tag is in there? I mean, I think that's the, the basic question. Do you have a right to know that? Now, if the industry says that's going to stop the, the, the development of RFID tags, that's, that, to my mind, that's similar to saying uh, putting a, a, a warning label on cigarettes may stop the sale of cigarettes and damage the economy because then people may not want to buy them. I think that's the whole point. There are people in the market, and they may be a very small percentage of people, that apparently a lot of people don't care about their privacy, but there is a, 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 a 
non-zero percentage of people who care very deeply about these issues. And I don't think that the industry should be allowed to advance its own agenda, its own development, its own everything else at, uh, by, by relying on consumer ignorance to do that. And I think Mr. Barr made a really good point when he said at some point when everything is tagged, well, he and I have two very different views of the future. And I believe that when I look at polls that say 60, 70 percent of people do not want to have RFID tags in their belongings, that the market should be allowed to make that decision. And if you let people know, then they can, and you give it your best shot, you tell us all the advantages and all the benefits and all of the savings and everything else, then if your argument prevails in the marketplace of ideas, you will win. But, but you don't do that by simply not telling people that it's there and then wait until 20 years down the road and then say, oh, by the way, every single thing you own has one of these hidden inside of it. You let people know, and if you are so confident that people will embrace your technology, you should be shouting it from the rooftops. You should be putting it in a big star right on the front and boasting about it. The fact that this industry is so afraid to tell consumers that there are RFID tags in the things that they buy, which is really what this boils down to, I think is a testament to the fact that they know people don't want them. And if you can't let people know you're doing it, you shouldn't do it. I thought it was because we didn't want it mandated in a way that was hard to implement, not that we didn't want to give notice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, Richard Curtis. I just want to point out that, to my knowledge, there are no members of the Retail Merchants Association of New Hampshire on a level that are anticipating using the technology that are not members of EPC Global and therefore have not accepted and pledged to abide by the EPC Global guidelines. And yet when I asked the president of EPC Global what was the penalty for not complying with those guidelines, I was told that it's voluntary and there are none. But you yourself indicated that Walmart is, is participating with labeling of their items, mm -hmm. right? I would like to think Walmart would continue to do that, but any EPC Global member that chooses to put an RFID tag in their, in their item could choose not to tell it. Board. Board. Well, it was just stated that the industry is not interested in tagging and not interested in informing consumers, and that is absolutely not the case. All of the subscribers to EPC Global are committed to our guidelines. And to comply with our guidelines, they have to put notice on the tags. And we are investing money in educating consumers about what that notice means. For instance, at a minimum, we say the notice has to be the EPC Global symbol. Some of our subscribers uh, put more on their tags, they, they use language, other things, but at a minimum it's the symbol and we feel it's important to educate consumers what that symbol means and we have been um, going forward with those education programs and so I think to say that the industry is not interested in informing consumers is not true. Is Checkpoint Systems a member of the Global? Yes, they are a member of EPC Global. And does EPC Global have some sort of disciplinary procedure for the fact that they are openly right now promoting the use of hidden RFID tags in consumer products, including shoes and clothing? I think that you should have Checkpoint Systems come and speak to this group if you think that that's what they're doing, because I can't, I, I just can't, I can't imagine that anything that makes the customer ultimately uncomfortable. Manufacturers and retailers are not going to do. It's a very competitive atmosphere. Excuse me, could I just, for a second, just a terminology issue here. Uh, Dr. Will you refer to the industry? Are you referring to the, uh, the uh, uh, for example, uh, IPC, or are you referring to the entire membership as the industries? I mean, there will be, I think, exceptions to all rules. So I just want to know what you're really sure. referring it, it to. Are we talking it. about the the, uh, the uh, industries such as that, that do this sort of labeling, or are we referring to all those members that would maybe use the labeling? Well, which is it? Or, I think it which is it on, referring? On the context, but typically when I refer to the RFID industry, I'm referring to the type of people who go to RFID journal conferences, representing that portion of their companies that is planning to profit from RFID. For instance, oh, excuse me. Go ahead. Uh, for instance, you mentioned Checkpoint Systems. I, I think they're probably an organization we should hear from here. But I can't imagine that, for instance, Walmart requires Best Buy, all of the large stores that are using this technology require that the EPC Global symbol be on the label. So why would 
the checkpoint want to do that. They're a, a company that does uh, anti-theft devices. I don't know who they can sell their anti-theft devices to if they don't comply with notice. Mr. Penny, and, and a question for Dr. Alder too. I, I didn't see that up the um, RFID journal article, but I am familiar with that tag. Um, but, I'm, but I'm wondering, did it mention that that tag is deactivatable? It does. That's important. That's important. So it is, it is deactivated, just like a regular. E so, but right. for, as far as I know, most hidden EAS tags are hidden because you don't want a potential theft to know they're there. But the person who does buy them, they deactivate the tag before they leave the store. Um, sometimes they don't, and that's why the buzzer goes off. Both the checkpoint tag, which is that little white, excuse me, the um, sensormatic tag, which is the little white chiclet box that's on the drugs, and there's another tag that looks like a, a label. It's about this big, and it looks like a coil. Um, that's the sensormatic tag, and both of those tags are deactivated at the register. You wipe this thing over, and, and so was that RFID the, tag deactivated the as well? The EAS portion of the tag is designed to be deactivated. But the RFID one is not? It is not specified in this article okay. whether it is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two points relative to that last discussion, if I'm understanding this correctly. Um, my understanding is drawing a distinction between the two types of systems. Um, Anti-theft systems, my understanding is, are typically engaged in at the retail level. The store will put their own tags on, take their own tags off um, of the clothing. The scenario that I'm envisioning is, again, an ETC tag is placed on somewhere before it lands on the on the store shelf or in the store warehouse. Um, the second point is, some may think this is this statement is naive. Using the scenario that there's a tag in a piece of clothing, and um, and I'm not going to mention um, any retailers by name because they really hate that. Um, retailer A. Um, is using the system and tracking people, detecting things in the shoes. Presumably, then we're going to market to to the customer as as they they walk past a certain store shelf. Well, eventually, you're going to figure it out. And I have to believe, and I know, the customer loyalty is one of the foundations of any retailer's business. So it's too easy to jump from a Walmart or a Target to a Kohl's or a Sears. Very easy. Those choices are here in Concord within a few months. If, if the retailer violates the customer's trust, I've said it before, at the very least, they're going to start shopping somewhere else in droves. I don't see that scenario happening. Actually, I'm, that's the one area in which I am an expert because I wrote my dissertation on it. Um, Excuse me. I, I, Excuse me. You are recognized. I will be represent. Mr. Winters, Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. I, I feel much better about speaking up if the Retail Merchants Association has two voices speaking that I can see as a second member of Congress Committee. Um, but I was, I was listening, and uh, Dr. Albrecht, I thought, asked a very good question to Ms. Ward, and I didn't think you quite answered it. Um, the question was, yes or no, does EPC have a some sort of system in place to discipline um, EPC subscribers, I think you called them, who do not put a label on their product? Is there any sort of disciplinary action that you can take against those people? We uh, do not, and we can't do that uh, because we're part of the organization that signs all of the barcode numbers, and our lawyers tell us that to do that, we have to, for instance, give a barcode number to any organization that wants a barcode number. We can't discriminate on this. It's uh, because of the public service um, orientation of the the uh, service that we provide. But we have looked at different accountability programs, and currently we are testing one in Germany, putting one together, where we are putting together a council of consumer groups, policymakers, and retailers to decide what should some sort of accountability, again, a voluntary accountability program look like. We are currently looking at that in Germany, and if that if that model works, we could um, possibly be considering doing it elsewhere, including in the United States. Thank you. Uh, there are some comments that were made 
to the extent that uh, perhaps we are going to require people to put uh, chips in. That's not the case at all. We're not requiring them to put chips in. This is a voluntary thing on the part of the manufacturer. All we're saying is, if you put one in, you should also put a label on it saying, this contains an RFID chip. It doesn't even have to be an EPC Global. It can be like the mercury. This product contains mercury. Simple line. This product is in, contains or has an RFID chip attached. That's all we're asking. It's, it's, not a, it's not a difficult product. It's not a difficult thing. It's done at the manufacturer's level. It's not going to affect the small businessman. It's not going to affect Walmart or anybody else. If you make it, put it on. Sure. So, let's get back to the main case in point. Do we feel as a group that it's necessary to have any kind of notice or label on the wholesale level? Yeah, the wholesale. Yeah, the wholesale. Well, that means when I'm going to use the classic example of we've got pallets going around, we have boxes of product going around, and it's strictly for shipping and, and inventory control. But the question wholesale level sort of implies at what stage in the sales process as opposed to supply stage. Chain. Yeah, in the supply chain. So maybe uh, I'm, maybe I'm looking very simply. I'm not. You got a box. You got a carton full of toothpaste. Too. I'm not buying a carton full of toothpaste tubes. Typically, when we refer to that, we were right on our, we refer to it as a trading pallet level. Whatever you want to call it. So the question is again? The question is, at the level that's what we would call non-retail, how's that? No. It's not a business. No. Well, 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 you, know, like, you, you guys, mean, look, look, you guys can characterize it any way you want. The point I'm trying to make is, we have two levels here. We have one that impinges upon individuals, and we have one that technically doesn't impinge upon individuals. It's, it's strictly, to me, an industry of... I guess it's whether whether it's at the shelf level or, or not at the shelf I'm sorry. Uh, model or... You know, it's an industry model as opposed to a retail model. I mean, you have, you know, I'm not trying to be mystical here. You've got a pallet of stuff that's going from so-and-so to Walmart, right? I mean, it's just that simple. Yeah. No, and then you have a tube of toothpaste that I'm buying from the drugstore. Okay. So the How question, do you want to characterize Which question is it? Well, do, do we have, agree that no labeling is required at crate level? At crate, 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 what is it, crate and um, pallet? Case, case and pallet. Case and pallet. Case and pallet. Case and pallet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before we get into that, um, and I apologize for not speaking with you before the meeting started, but because we had the same scenario with Richard on the phone at the last meeting, and, and oh, I have permission um, to be here, I'd be happy to, to step aside and let Richard be the sole representative at this point, um, if, if that's your wish. I don't have a problem one way or the other. I just, I really want to kind of reduce this to a point of, of retail and wholesale, and then we'll look at it in simplistic terms. And I feel that there's no problem with lack of notification at a wholesale level. You can call it what you want. Case and pallet. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That's comfortable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Something. We agree on something. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Now, the second question is, okay, the second question is, Obviously, we have, um, as been pointed out, several scenarios. The scenario is it may be incorporated in the product, as in the heel of a shoe or within the weaving of cloth or something like that. And it may be something that can be peeled off or detached or deactivated. Do we feel that if it could be deactivated or detached or peeled off, the notification is necessary? Yes. yes. Well, raise your hand when you say yes. Okay, you're the boss. Count. Okay, I'm not the boss, but I will count. Clarify the question. Clarify the question. Clarify the question. Before you vote, I'd like to ask Richard, or just inform Richard that he's voting. Okay. Not me. Uh, before you vote, I'd like to ask Richard. Or just inform Richard that he's voting. Okay. Not me. Uh, what I'm looking at here is, is that we'll go back to the Hewlett Packard analogy, which I think is really good, the printer analogy. You have a box, and they're doing that for almost inventory control when it goes into a Staples or when it goes into a, a large big box store, or whether it goes to the local retailer who sells it probably roughly the same price. Uh, on there, you could have a detachable RFID chip 
if you will, RRD chip, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, or you could actually have something that could then be deactivated. And that's really, once again, for inventory control. What happens is when you have something incorporated, I don't care if it's for recycling or not, something that's still track. What you have is you have a situation where that RRD, how's that, is incorporated into the body of the product. Now then, I think that there's a responsibility of the manufacturer to notify the public that there is that incorporated into the body of the product. And I'm looking at it for both positive and negative reasons. The positive reasons are, well, we know it's a Hewlett Packard uh, printer and or computer or electronic product, and therefore we know that they can then use that for inventory control, particularly if we put an advanced disposal fee on it at some point down the line. But at the same time, if I'm buying a pair of shoes from a pretty high class shoe store and they want to do this, I really don't care the reason why they want to do this, whether they want to do it because they want to maintain customer loyalty or they're scared that I'm going to go from you know, Target to Walmart or something else. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me. The mere fact that that thing, whether it's passive or active or whatever, or whether we haven't even really devised or understood the technology as it could go, is incorporated in that product, I think it's incumbent upon the manufacturer uh, to notify us. And so what I'd like to do is examine that. So if we're, if we're all happy at the wholesale level that it's not really our concern, but we're really still very concerned about notification, and we don't want to impinge upon the small business, how do we deal with that issue? Do we turn around and say after the fact, and they'll, they'll be on the floor, do we say after the fact, oh, well, they didn't deactivate it, so they caused harm to Dr. Albrecht, so Dr. Albrecht now has the ability, or has recourse to go after them because of the harm because they didn't do their duty. That's one thing. Or by the same token, we sit back and we say, uh, it's been notified and Dr. Albert now knows this. And Dr. Albert says, can you deactivate it or whatever? At least I know not to wear that jacket, if you will, into Walmart's because they'll get mad at it. You see the point I'm trying to make? I really want to get it down to, I want to distill it down to a fun. Can I clarify those questions? Sure. So, uh, uh, or summarize the question before, before we have discussion. So what, what I see is, the, the next two questions that you just asked are, do we agree that labeling is required if a tag can be easily removed? Yes or no. And do we agree that labeling is required if a tag is incorporated? Yes or no. Yes. And the subset on the first part, if, if the, the retailer, if you will, or the store doesn't do what they claim they're going to be doing, then maybe they'd be, able to, be obliged to suffer a penalty. Well, can, can we ask the first two questions and then sure. talk about the liability issue? Sure. I, I, it sounds to me like that's a show of hands. So, 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 so let's take just one question at a time. Yes. <laughs> so we, question one we discuss it first. Okay, so show of hands, do we agree that labeling is required if tag can be easily removed? I don't, I don't think we're ready to. Labeling and notice may be different. Well, that's right. Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, I, I think there seems to be that there should be a little bit more discussion. Okay. Go sure. ahead with that. This is just, well, I got a question about questions. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. It's kind of, I, I'm just, maybe I'm just being obtuse or something, but I'm... I understand. Why? We are. If, if it's removable, we have to tell them it's there. So there's no question of labeling if it's removable. Otherwise, you don't know they can remove it. No, I'm, so I'm throwing it. It seems like a moot question. Well, no, I'm throwing out for discussion. If it's removable or, 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 or able to be deactivated, do we need to label it or not? Do we need to notify the public? If it's deactivatable by the seller or by the consumer? No, by the seller. Different question. Placing I responsibility. Okay. Well, I'm placing responsibility on the retailer. They're saying, oh, no, we're only using this for X purposes. Okay. So now the responsibility is if they don't do this and it causes, let's say, Dr. Albrecht some harm, they now have strict liability. Don't do what? Consumer, I get home, I want to yeah, show off my tag. You have to tell me that's different. Right. Well, you're looking at consistency of motivation. That's right. Yes, sir. Basically, yeah. you would see that the purpose of the doesn't, doesn't be, isn't deviated from it. That what we're trying to put together? Yeah. As long as we can keep the purpose honest. I have an observation about the question real quick. Is we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead of the agenda in addressing the deactivation, which I'm not sure. They all sure run together, I think. 
Well, no, we haven't talked about the acquisition at all yet, so I think we're still at the labeling stage, and, okay. and I'm yes. not sure I, we need to have a discussion as to the feasibility of the deactivation and, and the willingness of the industry to even look at that, I think, before we get there. So, so you think we're jumping ahead? I, well, I think just in bringing that piece in, because I think you're asking the right question, but I think that that one portion of the question may raise this, sort of bring us into a whole other conversation. And then uh, I just want to throw out one thing on this, which is um, we devoted an entire chapter in our book to tracking garbage. Uh, the industry has, has frequently left to say, well, we'll just put it on the, on the packaging and then you'll throw the packaging away. We found actually several uh, patents developed by major corporations like Bell South, a uh, parent company, I think the reason for Singular Wireless, to literally um, track people's garbage after the fact. And one company that now belongs to IBM called Isogon uh, came up with a reader that could be mounted on the side of the car and driven down the street to read people's garbage and literally link it up with their household. So I'm not sure that you, the distinction, that the proper distinction is between disposable or non-disposable. I think the crate and pallet versus item level is, is definitely relevant. Okay, all right. In other words, you're concerned with the disposable question, and you see is that, that coming up down the road, so you feel comfortable if we're talking about this question without the disposable aspect exactly. in the question? Exactly. Make a change in the question uh, so that we're not just dealing with the disposable sure. issue. Can do we do that? Uh, according to Representative Kurt's original document, 358 S2, was talking about labels required. Separate item. S3 was removable and removable and deactivation. I think we should separate these items. Do we do we require a label? After that, let's talk about removing the activation. Separate. That's the, that's the issue we were discussing. Yeah, that's what I want to get down to. Okay. So, so uh, the question, if we revise the question and then we can eliminate the uh, aspect okay, of so the question that dealt with disposable, can we can we revise that so question so that it's still working? If we out? revise the question, then is do we agree that labeling is required if the item is individually tagged? Is that, is that the question? Well, that's part of the question. I, <laughs> well, think that, I really do think that going down the line, we're going to have to talk about whether it's removable or not, or whether it can be deactivated or not. And so, I don't know what this this poor fellow is doing. Mr. Chairman, please let me know when I'd like to recognize. <laughs> Go right ahead. Okay. Um, this is I thought we, by the way. The general question we were asking first was not specifically labeling, but the general question of notice. And because we identify that there might be different ways with different industries that, that notice would have to be given, it may not always be exactly with a label. And if it, it may be more, a more general question in the sense of the overall committee, do we think notice and labeling would be a form of notice, do we think that should be mandated or remotely readable devices? That would seem to be a good yes or no, and then you can get into the subtleties of the other issues you've raised after you get a good sense on that one. It's a suggestion. I'm afraid subtleties are a problem here. Yeah, appreciate the yes or no. Anyway. <laughs> I think uh, Mr. we need to, as a scanner, we need to make the point that labeling and notice are different things. Notice yes. is not necessarily included with the packaging, whereas labeling in my understanding, is something that is on the package or item. Right. So we have to be careful about that distinction. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I would also say that their notice can also persist after the original owner has disposed of the item. So we've talked about that too. Uh, sometimes there may be a need for more persistent notice than just a label. So we've, we've opened up that whole discussion before in our committee meetings. That's why I thought notice was the preferred discussion, and then you could talk about how you implement notice in a second component. But whether you want to mandate notice or labeling, I thought that would be our first item of discussion. That's what we've been talking about most of the day, I think, uh, is whether or not we want mandate or, or not mandate. That's why we're sitting here. Can we start with uh, rep Representative Kirk's original label required, no consumer product or identification document to which the tracking device or devices have been affixed or implanted shall be sold or, offered, sold or offered for sale or provided to a consumer without a, without a label contain, containing a consumer notice of such tracking device, period. That's what Representative Kirk had. It limits it 
to a device that is to something that is being sold requiring some type of label. Forget about the notification later. Can we talk about the labels? That's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And that's obviously what we're trying to do. <coughs> this is Gordon. Uh, I had a question. Uh, in the chairman, I question if uh, an RRD is incorporated in the body of the product. The question for the way he framed the question, so she probably would. I'm sorry, I thought you were addressing it. No, the way you framed the question is that the RRD is incorporated into the body of the product. Is that referring to um, the device helping the product to operate? So, for instance, no. No, so it's just strictly for traffic and work. Okay, so. That's, that to me is the concern. So this whole track. I mean, if, if I buy a jacket at Walmart, God forbid, um, and it has a tracking device in the hotel, I even want that to be activated or I want to know that it's there. I was, so if it's in the product, helping the product, say uh, the computer chassis, computer printer chassis, communicate with another product printer, that's not an issue. I'm not going to make that kind of a subjective analysis. If, if there is a device that's readable, I don't care what it does. If it's in there, then I think I should be notified. It's remotely readable. Yeah. So I'm sticking to the to the terms of our language. I'll be right back and check out lunch for us. Mr. Schultz, um, this, back, back to a technology question, I, I just kind of clicked when, um, obviously, I didn't call the name, but um, uh, regarding um, when a device is designed, by design uses some sort of radio frequency. Does anybody have any ideas about FCC regulation? I know these are unlicensed bands and things like that, but I also was under the impression that any device that emits a radio frequency of any sort might require some sort of notice that it does that. No? Yeah, it's just got the FCC approved. It doesn't have to have a stamp saying FCC something. The product that emits a radio, uh, a radio signal has to be FCC approved. But it doesn't have to be licensed unless it's a certain one. I know it doesn't have to be licensed. It doesn't have to be labeled. Uh, cordless phone, unlicensed band, says, uh, uh, corresponds to FCC regulation, blah, 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 must accept interference, all those things. But it still says that it emits radio frequency and complies with FCC regulation this. It's not licensed, and it states that it's not licensed and complies with that unlicensed. You can get a clarification that a, a remotely re readable device is, is the ones we're talking about for the most part here are, are passive, not em emitting, right. they're receiving and then responding to the mission. Uh, would that put them in this category of regulation of FCC? They, or they'll still emit a radio frequency when probed. Mm -hmm. The way some of them work is they have no battery pack. This is walk by something close enough that it emits an electrical current, it then gets activated and it sends out an R signal of some sort with certain codes and so now it is regulated. So regardless of whether it carries its own power source or not, it's kind of irrelevant. And so I just I don't know if that's something that can be answered again, like computer crimes law. If an FCC regulation says it has to have a stamp saying it's emitting, then a lot of this is moved. Can anyone answer that question? I can't answer that. It's John Dumas. I can't answer that question, but I, that's, I think that's where I've been driving all along is that if it's at a federal level and it's required uh, uniformly across all the states, I think there's no question that, that you know, it, it would be implemented, it would work, it would be there. But when we're trying to do something unique for New Hampshire, a uh, small state, I think you're going to have a lot of problems with, with small manufacturers trying to comply with this. Shouldn't or couldn't EPC be able to answer that? They make a product that emits an R. We don't make the product, so I, and I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar. Excuse me, just, just oh, you make a label. Sorry. Uh, no. I'm just curious. Could I could I ask uh, Ms. Norwood? Could you do you have any input as as regards uh, FCC regulation? I you know any anything about uh, whether or not this could be covered under FCC regulation? I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. I'm sorry. Could you get a definitive answer back for? Us? I could try to find out from the FCC. Mm -hmm whether anything that emits a radio frequency would have to be labeled as such. Or whether there has to be some notification. Barry? Thank you. Um, a previous comment regarding the, um, the labeling requirement in Representative Kirk's latest draft. I, I'm sorry, it's not quite that simple. Um, going back to one of the first points I made at this meeting, 
It says, no consumer product or identification document to which a tracking device, there's a problem there, or devices have been affixed or implanted shall be sold or offered for sale. That puts the liability and the responsibility squarely on the retailer, to which we object. Is it offered for sale from the wholesaler? No, offered for sale. I'm the store, I offer it for sale right. to the consumer. From the wholesaler, I'll offer it to the retailer. But after the, after that, the retailer. Point of, point of information, can you tell me where are you reading from? Um, this is in Representative Kirk's draft. Okay, but then we're not we're not talking about anything that we've uh, previously agreed right, to or present law, right? We're not talking about present law. We're not talking about right. the amendment either. We're talking about possible well, suggestions for the future. The comment was made that, that was this should be the starting off point. Mm -hmm. And I'm just okay. pointing mm -hmm. out that you know there are several objections that we have to this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I wasn't presenting this as a, as a fait accompli. All I'm saying is there was a separation between labels required and then a separate section of removal and deactivation. Yes, yes. These were being mixed. I thought we should discuss labels first because if you don't clear up the labels thing, you don't have to worry about deactivation. Right. Yeah. We, I, I don't think we have yet answered the question whether we as a group think that labeling is required, what, regardless of who pays for it or how it's implemented, I don't think we've answered the question of whether we as a group think that labeling should be required if the product is tagged outside of the store. You know, once it's passed the store's, the store's uh, doors, it's still active. We haven't answered that question. Is, is, is that sort of like a note here? The, you tag off the mattress yeah. because you get a rest. Well, yeah. if, if it's deactivated, then it essentially doesn't work past the doors of the store. But the question is, if it's still a working tag outside of the store, do we believe that it needs to be labeled? Well, well I, I know, I understand. But you see, in these <laughs> questions, it's, it's easy to ask them, but they're obviously not easy, easily answered. Dr. Albrecht, as you said, a label could be affixed to a package uh, there's nothing that says that that label would necessarily be deactivated, even if it ends up in the in the trash. True. So, so I mean, now the now the question is, uh, are we concerned about the part that's going to go in the trash, or or are we concerned about the part that might uh, be in in the product, uh, you know, uh, that uh, can be tracked uh, with someone wearing it, and if that becomes two separate separate issues. So we. It's not easy to ask simple questions in this area, which is becoming <coughs> very obvious at this point. Can we, I hate to sound like a broken record, can we maintain a distinction between labeling and notice? That's right. You keep saying labeling, but we really haven't gotten into labeling very much. We've been talking about notes so far. If I've I been paying been attention. Talking. I think we've been talking about labeling. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I disagree have, with that completely. But. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're obviously going to have crossover. We're, I mean, if we're looking for purity here, we're not going to find it here. But notification there's, there's, there's would no be question. Much but but what, you will at least attempt. We'll attempt to stay on the subject, even though I know that's not it, not easily done. Mr. Chair, if I may. Surely. Okay. When we dealt with raw milk, the, the environment and agriculture community, <coughs> the labeling to us was we had a bottle of raw milk that we wanted to be able to retail in the store. So we wanted to put a label on there saying caution. This is raw, not caution, but this this is a raw milk product. The raw milk. So that means label. Notice, because we felt that it was okay that if a restaurant wanted to serve raw milk or incorporate raw milk into its product or its, its whatever they were making, we said that you would either require the grocery store to say raw milk products are sold here mm -hmm. over the case because that's a market that some people want. So that's notice. This is what you consider notice. Or if you went to a restaurant where you were served, able to serve raw milk, notice went in two places, in the restaurant, in an obvious place, and also on the menu. So to me, that's notice. Labeling is the actual product where you cannot remove the raw milk, obviously. So in this case, the way I look at labeling is I can't readily or easily remove that RRD tag. So that, to me, should be labeled. If, I, if, if you want to get into the, the in-depth argument about should a store say notice caution some products may have RRD tags, 
that's a whole other can of worms. But to me, what's important now is, is it incorporated in the body of the product? Well, not too many chance of packaging yet, but in the body of the product, the actual Hewlett Packard Premium, is that tag incorporated in the body of the product? If it is, then it should be labeled. Support. So then, if uh, you're making a distinction, if you had a jacket, for instance, with hang tags on it, mm -hmm. that you normally today cut off, price tag, information about you know, how to wash it, etc., have a whole bunch of hang tags on clothes today. <laughs> if one of those was the RFID tag, would you consider that easily removable? I don't know yet, but I think I would almost agree to that. To me, what's more important is there's something that isn't readily removable and incorporated in the product. I very much would want to have labeling for that purpose. I'm not, I'm not so certain on that, but, but I did want to raise that question, so I'm not so certain. Uh, that, that brings up the, if you don't mind. Mm. Uh, but at, at the point in time that I'm wearing my coat and, and my coat uh, has a label on it, that can't be easily removed, I probably wouldn't be too interested in buying any such coat that be, I'd be walking around with with, with a label uh, on the coat mm -hmm. to start with. I mean, at least it ought to appear like it, that it's meant to be a, a coat. And if it's not easily easy to see, then that would obviously be another problem. So the idea is it's easy to see and it's a label. I mean, if both of those, it doesn't seem like a very marketable product to me. It seems like most people are concerned with this distinction between in the product, on the box, whatever, but at the basic level we're worried about an active chip leaving some place with a consumer. Whether it's on a hang tag, you can't say easily removable, doesn't matter because they still need to know it's there because some people don't want to hang it in the closet so they're going to get rid of it. Or they don't even want it in the trash. I mean, I'm not, these are, these are all realistic examples that people use. If it leaves the store with a consumer and it's active, it probably needs a label. I think that's what most people are concerned with labeling that set. Yes. Now, if it's on the box and not in the body of the printer, is that box expected to go home with the consumer? It should be on the box. If it's in the printer, inside the box, the printer is expected to go home with the consumer. It should, they should be know that before they walk out of the store. Mm -hmm. If it's on the shaving cream case and not on the shaving cream bottle, some people may have concern with that, but that's a different discussion because that has to do with the um, supply chain. But the bottle goes on the shelf, the box is now gone by the store, and so the bottle walks around in the store, goes home, but regardless, the label never went home with the consumer that was active. So, a discussion about what happens inside a store, I think, is a different discussion. Mm -hmm. But, still relevant. But if it goes home with the consumer, a label. I think that's the basic question we're going back to mm -hmm. um, about notice, or not notice, um, labeling. I, I can't remember how the first question was before that we kind of jumped back on saying, you know, the question's not ready yet. Does it go home with the consumer? We, we actually had two questions. One was if it can be removed, or and the second was was if it is in, integrated into the product itself. And in those two cases, might still be active going home with the consumer. But essentially, outside of the store, they're, they're yeah. still active. That's the problem I think most people have. Right? It leaves the store. Active. Whether whether it can be removed or not, they don't want to be carrying a tag out without no. knowing. Without knowing. There you go. I guess anyone. <laughs> are, we, are, we, are we saying we have, have some agreement or what are we saying? Yeah, we, we have this is Bob Reese, really actually. I'm saying I, I wouldn't mind hearing that again. Go right ahead. <laughs> one, one more time. Um, if, if there's a label, I mean, if there's a tag, whether we call it RRD or RFID, if there's a tag that can be read, and it leaves the store and is still active, we believe, do we believe that there should be a label telling the consumer that? I think just that there's a label attached. Exactly. If the label leaves the store with the consumer. a separate item, uh, it seems to me, which Representative Kurt addressed, if there is an RFID chip in a product, there should be notification, a label to tell you that there's an RFID chip on this or in or on this and, and, and that's the question. And I don't know if we're going to raise hands, show hands to... Why not? I think we should. If there is an active tag 
that leaves the store with the consumer, should there be a label? Yes or no? You say yes? No. <laughs> if I may, I just I have a What's question. What's your name? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Melissa Lawler. I'm representing um, the New England Financial Services Association. And um, with Last name is Lawler. And you're, you're, sitting in, yeah. please, you're sitting in for? I'm sitting in for a member who could not be here um, this afternoon. Um, but with any sort of warning that we have, whether it be nut milk or raw meat, um, cigarettes, alcohol, there is within that a actual warning. And just by notifying the customer that there's an RFID chip in the item, what are we really warning them of? It, if it seems like, um, I'm sorry, but I think you referenced that a large majority of the population um, doesn't know that these chips exist and they have no real concern about it. So if we're just putting on there a blanket, this contains an RFID chip, you know, are we kind of on a witch hunt? Do we want to add some sort of other cautionary, you may be followed, or this item, you know, can be followed once you leave the store? Come on. I want to hear from you, Oh, I thought you had your hand right. Then, then let, me, <laughs> let me take that one. I, I, I think that regardless of whether everybody thinks that it's paranoia or not, there are some people who are concerned about this, and we have to address that. Uh, I don't think it's a witch hunt. I think that it, it's a consumer right to know if, if they're being tagged or not, essentially. And that's why we're discussing it. Sorry. Um, Mr. Bernie, please. I'm not sure I understood your point. I, I didn't get that from what you said. Can you I, please I, make I'm my sorry, point? if I may. Bernie. Um, I, I'm sorry. I, I um, misspoke there. Um, I, I don't mean that to say that these are, are good things or bad things. Mm -hmm. What I mean to say is that within any other warning, there is within that in, that if you eat raw meat, you could get sick. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure by saying that this contains an RFID chip that, um, that the, that's going to really fulfill what we want to do here. I think that people need to know, well, what, what does this chip do? Um, and that should be somewhere in there. And do we really, can we really say, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in here, you know, a few innings late in the game, but, um, I, I guess what I'm gathering too is that each chip has different information and then has, there's a different security level that could be breached, I guess, with, with each chip as well. Did you want to follow up? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Curious, and not to say that anything she said is right or wrong, but I also think that that's more goes back to then what is the extent and quantity and uh, content of labeling. What me and Representative Halen kind of came to agreement on in terms of that question is yes or no, whether or not it should. And if, I don't know, based on uh, process, if I'm allowed to say this, should we, I would like to ask if we could go to a vote on that. And if we do, if we can, and we say yes, then we discuss more points like this, to what extent will the label be, which is another discussion. Again, if the answer is no, we're kind of in a different place still. So, um, just to move forward, as we all come to hang out. Thank you, recommend. Great. Do you want to call that question? Do you want to restate your question? Okay. Um, do we agree that labeling is required? Uh, if a tag is active after leaving the store, period. And that's that presuming at the retail level. Say, yeah, cool. right. so well, after after it leaves a product tag, do we agree that a product tag needs to be labeled if the tag is active after leaving the store? Why are you adding after the store? Why don't you just say is offered for retail on RFID chip is it active? Well, it, because we in theory it could be deactivated also, before it's well, left. Well, that's a separate item. No, it's, uh, let's, let's slow down for just a second. Yeah. Hands, please. I was just saying that the in-store is a different discussion, and I even stated how 
there are people who want to continue discussing what happens in a store. But as very, in terms of consumer privacy, once they leave the store, uh, the way Representative Kagan put it, it's very clear. It doesn't preclude any further discussion on what happens in a store, supply chain, tracking movements inside, things like that. But very specifically, in the case of a consumer leaves a store with a product, should they know by a label if there's an active chip? We say yes or no to that, but hypothetically we say yes, they should. Now we move back in and now we're in the store. We want to be tracked, or walking around the store, I pick this up from one shelf, put it down another shelf. That's a different discussion because I'm not leaving a store with it. And that goes back to other things like EAS and security internally. That's a different discussion, yes, right. I feel. I agree. So very simply, if the consumer leaves a store with a product with an active tag, should there be a label telling them that? Can a chip be reactivated? It should be changed. I mean? It can be changed. I would think that would include reactivation. I'm sorry to jump in because this goes back to what uh, Dr. Albrecht brought up the article, and Mr. Pernice wasn't certain of. The same article does say that in order to use the EAS function, the chip code can be changed. And if it's changed to this, it's now been purchased and the theft piece won't deactivate, won't apply. But there's still. But there still can be left the rest of the art ID piece in there. Which goes through a whole other different thing in the year something we've been talking about this when we first started this. We all said that our ID chips don't get changed. So in less than a year, we are now talking about chips that get changed from the manufacturer of the chip. If I could just follow up with this. So my point being is that it makes no sense to say you may have an a, uh, active chip out there. The fact is that product may contain an inactive chip that may, as technology moves forward, right. Be reincorporated with a new tracking model. Manchuria so, Canada. Manchuria <laughs> Canada. Yeah. Right. So the fact is, is that you, you just may want a phrase that says this product contains an RRID or RFID chip. Whether it's active or inactive, is, is really a matter of what the consumer needs to be aware of, aware of and then. Well, I, the point the beyond the activated that, could be destroyed too. Well, activated, well, but we don't know that. We don't know that. You don't know when that thing walks out the door whether it was destroyed. You know, the clerk was in a hurry, or the uh, consumer was in a hurry. The other issue that you're going to have is that you know you talk about the sports coat. Are you going to know where that chip is inside the product? You know, <laughs> this manufacturer may put it in the shop, the next one may put it in the ham, the next one may put it in the lapel. So the thing is, I think what the consumer really needs to know is whether or not it has a chip or does not have a chip incorporated in the Correct. And it doesn't matter whether it's active or inactive. That's what you're saying. That's correct. Right. Because now we're moved in, we're moved, excuse me, we're moved in a, a rather a different direction because is it, whether there's a what the motivation is for having a chip leave the store being incorporated in any, in any product without labeling it begins to go to the question of the motivation is, is the big issue and, and at that point in time I'm trying to determine what motivation would be there to have a product which would be basically in there on a stealth or, or, or some other basis other than having to do with marketing. At that point in time, it gets to the question of so much about labeling, maybe that's part of it, but to, to me, it would be a question of whether you'd want to have it be legal, period, to have, have tracking devices that were being used for whatever purpose and, and not, not an obvious one, whether you would want to even discuss uh, having such devices there, period. And then we're not talking about labeling at all. Because now we just simply make it illegal to put it in, and if it's discovered that it is in there, someone's broken the law. Well, I'd like to give, this is Bob Pernice, I'd like to give two examples that might illustrate that a little bit further. About five years ago, a company from the UK marketed a toy. It was a Star Wars talking head that basically when the new, when the new uh, movies came out, you would hold a device next to this thing and it would speak some line from the movie. That was an RFID device that communicated from the speaker to the, to the person. Now, do we want to legislate against that? Probably not. Is what is what I'm thinking. I don't mean to speak for the group. The other example that I that I would want to give is indeed there might be a manufacturer who would want to put a tag inside a device either 
for work in process, okay, this goes from here to here to here to here. And we know that we did this to it. For example, uh, window manufacturers, there are many, many different iterations that a window can go through to be manufactured. And does it go down this glazing line? Does it go here? Does it go here? Does it go there? Okay. The other is, and now that may never leave the factory, but it's on the device. If, if, it, if it does leave the factory, then that's something that we want to answer. A third example would be, say, a high-end television or something like that. There are companies that are considering doing this for recall and for, you know, rather than, oh, I lost my receipt, I don't know if this is uh, 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 where I got this, it was given me to a gift. Well, by tagging that item, they can tell exactly where it came from, exactly where it was sold to, and there may indeed be benefits to the consumer for that. So those are some of the reasons that I think are not surreptitious or, uh, or nefarious for tagging a device. Well, but, uh, but then the question comes out. Then the question comes out: Is is there any problem with disclosure in those kinds of situations? Oh well, I think that that's why what we're trying to answer. But I thought you were saying, why would somebody want to do this anyway? And well, that's, that's I, what I, I understand. Was but I mean, those I, all of those examples that would see, would seem to me that there would be uh, any manufacturer would look at it and say, okay, somebody could look at this. I mean, we, we've got a harmless or or a perfectly good manufacturing, distribution, whatever reason for doing this, but at the same time, since we're going to possibly send this out into the, into the world with an active uh, RID device in it, that we would want to cover that base and make darn sure that there's not an assumption of, of uh, nefarious uh, motivation here, and we want to let the people know that uh, there's a good reason why it's there. And I don't see there could be any problem as far as notification or so the schools are there. Um, I go back to Representative Kirk's original document, S2 and S3. One was labels required, S3 was removal and deactivation. Uh, Colonel Wilkes made this comment about notification for a RFID device. It's on the shelf. Period. Removal and deactivation becomes a problem when the person gets ready to remove it from the store, given the option of having it, of removing it since he's notified or deactivated. I don't think that the problem of notifying that the device is going to be active when it leaves is, is a question here because if it's on the shelf, it's an RFID device. The second section will say the individual has a right to have it removed, to remove it. Have it or have it deactivated. Separate item. I just think the question is, do we tell people there's an RFID device on a product that you're getting ready to take out of the store? You may now separately deactivate it or have it removed. Or if it cannot be deactivated, do you want to buy it? Yeah, but that's notification almost uh, at the store level. I still want to deal with the product leaving the store which has a tag. I don't care about the motive, excuse me, right? I don't care about the motive. It's strictly subjective whether you think it's good or bad. You can approach that argument from either side. Merely what you're saying is, as the Colonel said, is there a device on that unit? Is it incorporated in the unit? Right. We're not making any value judgment as to whether it can be reactivated or whatever. Right. Is it on that unit and does it leave the store? Do we feel that there should be a label that says right. there's a unit at RRD? That's it in a nutshell, I think. Are we only concerned about tags on products? Or again, I bring up the typical consumer, at least I can say for myself, I have not yet purchased a product with a tag on it, but I do have credit cards with RFID tags. I've been in a hospital and given an RFID bracelet. I've taken out library books with an RFID tag. I mean, these are all RFID applications. Are we only focused on products in stores that aren't even there yet? For the moment, yes. I would like to really focus on that because the other column I had to discuss after this, once we all agree to that, is very simply what I call non-retail. Non-retail could be a library, could be a hospital, could be something else totally entirely. And there may be differentials there. There may be uh, nuances that are, you know, if a, if a school library wants to tag these things for whatever reason, do we think that's right? And I just don't want to get into that yet. I just want to stick with the retail. Used to sort of pull up and I'd love to call a vote on that. Do you think once it leaves the store, 
regardless of whether it's active or in that, passive or whatever, really doesn't matter. No, it, strictly no subjectivity whatsoever. The objectivity is there's a unit incorporated within a product and it's leaving the store. Do we think that that should have a tag? Yes or no? What's that? That person's like, 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 we, when Representative Kalin put the question, he said, if the tag is active and leaves the store, have you changed the question we so have. that if the tag is in the product, whether it's active or inactive? Right, right. because we've established that something could be reactive or removable as long as the tag is going with the consumers. Right. So, simple. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Yeah, very why. simple. Just they're very why. simple. Right. No, no subjectivity to it whatsoever. Right. Does it exist? Is it part of the product? Right. Yes or no? Right. Are we ready to call that question? Just <laughs> okay. Uh, if the tag is leaving the store, do we think that the product should have a label? Is that agreeable? Yeah. Yes or no? Uh, I would say not the way that's not agreeable. If the product is, if the product contains mm -hmm. a R I D R F I D. Well, I, I'm just calling it a tag for short. But right, right. But what was said to If the product is tagged, whether it's in the product or attached yeah. to the product. Right. If, if the product... If it leaves the store, it goes to the package with the product. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter whether it's on a tag like this one you have. Does it matter whether it's in the store or not? No, no, no. It doesn't matter whether it's... If the tag leaves the store with the product, do we think the product should have a label? Yes or no? Okay. Raise your hands for yes. No, go ahead. To vote on it or to vote on it? I'm trying to out whether it's in the store or in the store. What difference does it make? There is a difference. If it doesn't leave the store, then the consumer doesn't work. I mean, that's a different issue. If it doesn't leave the store, that's a different issue. Some people think. Okay. I, I'm, I'm Walmart, and I give all my employees smarts or whatever. That's a different. Well, but we we have tracking. We have tracking people as a separate issue. Just one quick point that might help clarify a little bit. Marks and Spencer in the UK, which is a, a retail chain over there, they sell RFID tagged garments that they're on hang tags that hang right. off of the item. And the last I heard, they were manually removing those. So mm -hmm. as they scan the item, they would tear off the tag and put it in the bucket. I think they were even reusing them at one point. Because they're expensive. So that, that's kind of what we're addressing here. Yeah. We wouldn't necessarily, in that scenario, under what we're discussing now, need a notice. And we can talk about in the store, we need it even before that. Way. If it literally goes across the threshold. Right. I think I'm for your purposes, I literally I walk out the door. I have a tube of toothpaste and I forget to buy it. I walk out the door. Technically, I'm shopping. I'll tell you. Yeah, once you leave the threshold. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so the question is, if the tag leaves the store with the product, do we think the product should have a label? Sure. And, um, we're saying with the consumer, right? With the consumer. Okay, okay. I can add that. It is now the consumer's property. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There's been a transaction. <laughs> if the tag leaves the store with the product with the consumer, yes. do we think the product should have a label? Yes or no? All yes. Those, all those in favor say Raise yes. your hands. Rich is going to need to avoid uh, keep, keep your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. And so did, what did Richard Varn want to do? Richard? I, I recorded it voting no, I think. Okay, but okay so don't raise so your hand. I'm not doing anything. Now, now the no's can raise their hand. Their hands. One, two, three. And Richard. And Richard, this is four. And I have to say, I think it should be, there should be notice, but it should not be legislated. Okay. Right. Well, that's fine. I mean, we feel it probably should. Well, this is just, <laughs> do you want a roll call? That's a separate question. <laughs> do we want a roll call? That's entirely the deal. Well, can you make it in a formal I guess that's a, a request from one of the commission members, so at least do. Yeah, then we'll have lunch. Okay. Well, that'll get the photo for the all right, let's start at that end. Um, I, I suppose uh, Mr. Winters, Representative Winters, is not a member. No, so the, you, 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 and state your name and, and 
Yes, please. Who, Just so what, I can keep track of it. What organization you represent? Hi. Um, we're Slaller, New England Financial Services Association. And um, That's fine. I'll support. Yes. Yes. And I'll there. Yes. Yes. And Schultz. Yes. Yes. I support it, but I. <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Or no. yes. <laughs> and I will abstain. Okay. Uh, you abstain. could no, you could do like uh, Senator Obama could be president. <laughs> we won't get into this. Hey, uh, uh, can I just yeah. say why? You know, you know, is, guys. I think we need to have more specific, <laughs> detailed language that we're trying to agree on. If we're talking about a concept, I, I think this is just right. the feel of the okay. committee. It's, so it's yeah. like a straw vote. That's yes, right. Yes. All right. Then I agree. Yes. Uh, so Erickson is a yes now? Yes. So, but this is strictly for the record, isn't it? It's it's a, a, it's a, a, it's a straw, straw vote. vote. Booth is yes. Well, I'm just putting last names in. <laughs> I, I can't keep track of titles. Um, you speed. <laughs> Without the fine print, the fine print we'll talk about after. Yes, yes. Of yes until we get to the fine In theory, print. yes. In theory, it's not a theory. Yes. 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 And yes. uh, Grimley. Yes. And um, Law. Yes. 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 Mr. Barn, no. Barn is no. And Dumas. Yes. Conditionally, yes. Yes. Or yes. I'd say the same thing. Conditionally, yes. Yeah. I'm just putting yes or no. <laughs> Sorry. No, <laughs> Lauren, no, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I end up with three no and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, yes. And what we'll do at that point is recess for about half an hour. Is that all right with you, Mr. Varn? We can Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, before we recess, something was said before that probably concerned a number of you, because we were very concerned about this. This had to do with the garbage being tracked. And we do have two solutions. Uh, first, in New Hampshire, that's a riot, according to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, that's a violation of your right to privacy, and you can sue. And secondly, and this was from the peanut gallery back here, why not just place your garbage in front of your neighbor's house? I told you that he was in my house. No, he was Absolutely. Mr. Gibson, 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 Mr. Gibson,